there's got to be some balance with this kind of stuff. And you got to consider all of these things before making your decisions and also realize that we don't know a lot. Yeah. Like there's a lot that we don't know. So what you don't want to do is negate uh, common knowledge. This is where I see a lot of problems where people will read a study. But like, well, the study doesn't say that that's, that's the case. And then look at other studies. Has this been duplicated? Yeah. And then what I like to do on top of that is I also like to compare it to conventional wisdom. What have people been saying for hundreds of years? Where do we see similarities and uh, practices that have existed for a long time? Or are there counters? And then you get a bigger kind of picture. Otherwise, you become, you get kind of science bound, meaning, you know, like you're like, well, unless I see it in a study, I don't believe it. Or the study said, therefore, it's 100% true. And we ran into a lot of problems with this. This cannot be communicated enough. It's good to be science based, but don't be science bound. So I'm bringing this up because uh, there was, I belong to groups on Facebook, right? Um, different, like a, there's a neuroscience group I belong to, one for biology, one for nutrition. Anyway, someone posted a study connecting um, high sodium intake to poor health. Now you look deeper into the study and what you see is that there's poor controls and lots of studies have, when the controls aren't right, you see some biases that come in that influence the results of the study. So I'll explain this one with, with sodium, right? We've been told for years and years and years and decades that a lot of sodium is bad for you. Like we've known this for a long time, at least according to mainstream uh, narrative. So what ends up happening is people who hear this, who are health conscious, consciously try to eat less sodium. So you start to develop a bias. Mm -hmm. Then when you look at studies now, people who eat a lot of sodium, oh, their health is worse. Why? Because they're, they tend to be the people who are less health conscious. They tend to eat other foods, processed foods. They tend to exercise less. They tend to do other things that are less healthy. So then we connect the sodium to that. If you look at well-done studies, you find that sodium is actually not connected to poor health in most cases. In fact, higher sodium intakes are better than too low of sodium intakes. And it goes like this for lots of different things. So that's why I want to kind of bring Isn't that, that very similar to what we found out about cholesterol too? Yeah. Same thing. Like, yeah. it, like you, they weren't controlling a lot of those other things that healthier people. Yeah. Well, a more common, uh, a, a really good one that's classic was that were the studies on coffee no, back in the cigarettes. day. Yeah. yeah. Back in the day, coffee studies uh, were connected to cancer. So it was like, oh my God, coffee's bad for you. But what they weren't controlling for was what a lot of coffee drinkers did back in the day, which was smoke cigarettes. Yep. So it's like, yeah, they got more cancer, but it wasn't the coffee. Um, there's studies on supplements like this too, where they'll show people who take multivitamins are healthier, but it's hard to see if it's the multivitamin or if it's the, the health bias that people who take multivitamins also tend to exercise, tend to eat right and so on. And so if you think back to some of the messages that we've gotten mm -hmm. throughout the decades around what's good and what's bad, many of them are wrong. For example, they told us margarine was better than butter. They told us to go fat free milk. They said, avoid egg yolks. So because of that messaging for so long, people who are health conscious would do those things. They would avoid butter. They would uh, you know, avoid egg yolks. They would eat fat-free dairy. So then in the studies, you'd see, oh, if you avoid those things, you're healthier. But that's because the health conscious people were doing those things. They also did other things that contributed to better health. I feel like there's a lot of factors with a lot of these studies that people don't realize um, that I think you – it would be helpful for you to kind of outline in terms of like how to read the study, yeah. how to look for certain characteristics of the study that makes it more valid than other studies um, in, in terms of the controls and all that, if you could explain that a little bit more. Yeah, well, there's um, there's observational, uh, which are based off of surveys, which are notoriously bad when it comes to nutrition. I mean, when you guys were trainers, like when people would come in and kind yeah, of tell you- Yeah, that you rely on people to honestly report, which is, we already Even know with that. the best intentions, people yeah, are off. Yeah. Right. So there's that. Um, so you want to, you want studies that are controlled where there's a double, where they're double blind, meaning that the researcher and the subjects don't know who's getting the ingredient or the supplement or the drug or whatever. So nobody knows. So there's no placebos going on, no biases kind of going on. Um, and then you want to see a large sample size. So if there's like, let me put it this way. If there's four people in a study, <clears throat> I could very easily pick four people who are going to respond in a particular way and and not if I pick a thousand people, I'm more likely to get yeah, a Yeah, the larger variety. the control, the better off. The larger the larger the, and longer the, the sample control, variables. Right? Yeah. And then who's in the sample? You know, uh, you know, 30 college aged males. Well, is it gonna be different if we're checking uh, you know, if we start to throw women in there or people who are older or younger? Like that, that's another thing mm -hmm. you want to kind of pay attention to. Um, and then look at other studies. 
Has this been duplicated? Yeah. And then what I like to do on top of that is I also like to compare it to conventional wisdom. What have people been saying for hundreds of years? Where do we see similarities and uh, practices that have existed for a long time or are there counters? And then you get a bigger kind of picture. Otherwise you become, you get kind of science bound, meaning, you know, like you're like, well, unless I see it in a study, I don't believe it. Or the study said, therefore it's a hundred percent true. And we ran into a lot of problems with this. We just recently saw a huge analysis of um, SSRI drugs and they just came out and said, serotonin, the serotonin model of depression is wrong, Yeah, yeah. which is crazy. We've been prescribing these drugs for decades. Now that's not to say that there isn't some effects and that people maybe not see some benefit. It may mean that we just don't know the mechanisms, but it's not the serotonin is what this thing is saying. And how long have we been prescribing these for, you know, four It's decades. so funny to me because I know on this show that I've, I've, I've been labeled as like the, the skeptical challenge yeah. Sal every time he brings a study to the yeah, table, yeah. but this is the reason why. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's because we rarely ever can replicate it. There's always so many other controls we control. And then you didn't, no one's mentioned yet or talked about, which I'm super fascinated, and the power of the mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, it, I mean, you could literally the nocebo take. nocebo and placebo. Effect. That's right. You could take s several of these studies and take a group of people that think negatively of the outcome. And, and and say there's 50 people that are just worry warts and they think it's going to be bad and their body's going to affect negatively and then take 50 other people who have a very positive outlook on life and think that, oh, they're going to be fine yeah. in this situation. And I bet you, you would see a dramatic difference in the results of that. To That's not acknowledge there's a belief system in right? there. It's crazy. So, so it's so funny when people uh, think that they, they kind of razz me about always being skeptical well, when we talk about studies, but that's the reason why. There's also a cause and effect that sometimes we flip. So like, for example, um, you could read a study that says uh, people who use marijuana, I'll just use an example. Um, people who use marijuana are more depressed and more anxious. So you could say the marijuana is causing the depression and anxiety. Or you could say people who are depressed and anxious tend to reach out for things that make them feel better. So they're more likely to, do mar to use marijuana. Or it's a combination of the two. So you, you, you want to be... You want to kind of look at things that way because it can be very misleading. Well, yeah, you could isolate certain parts too to make something sound good. You use the example. I told you I was getting in an argument with one of my buddies about, you know, them potentially vaccinating their their young daughter who has autoimmune issues and that just recently came out about the immune. And then of course he fired a PubMed study at me saying that, oh, the that the risk is 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 okay because you're better off taking it because of what it reduces potentially. And then your response to that was, you know, we could take a we could take a study that shows that six smoking cigarettes reduces anxiety by thirty percent. Yeah. So should you smoke cigarettes? Because you've isolated this one thing about oh, one effect. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. One positive effect from it because that's what you're trying to prove in this study mm -hmm. that hey, if you if you're a really anxious person, maybe cigarettes is actually a good choice. For yeah, you. because you're negating all the other potential effects and you're not throwing that in. So a good another example would be like um, chemotherapy is uh, is anti-cancer. So now the average person wouldn't just go take chemo because they're like, I don't want to get cancer because we know that chemotherapy comes along with its own risks and issues, right? So that's that's very true. So you could look at something that says, um, you know, causes weight loss. Be like, oh, this is going to be, this is going to be good. It's going to improve my health. Well, maybe it causes weight loss because maybe people lose muscle or their anxiety and stress goes up. So they eat less yeah. or they're depressed. So they eat less or who knows. Right. <laughs> so you want to look at these bigger pictures and what you don't want to do is negate uh, common knowledge. This is where I see a lot of problems where people will read a study. Well, but well, the study doesn't say that that's, that's the case. You know what my favorites is? I remember this a long time ago. It's when, when my, when my son was my oldest, who's now 17, right? When he was little, um, I don't remember what happened. One of us had a cough or something like that. And I, I brought up to the doctor, I said, sir, his pediatrician was my, was my client. And I brought up and I said, you know, um, when I was a kid, my mom would give me honey and tea and it would help my cough. And oh, that's an old wives tale. You know, that's not really, you know, that, that's, that's, there's no studies to show that that actually works. I'm like, really? Because they've been using honey for right. hundreds or maybe thousands of years for coughs. Yeah. You know, it's just a, a you know, it's an old wives tale. Well, Literally that year, a study comes out showing there's a compound in honey that suppresses the cough reflex in the brain, and that may be why it helps with cough. So then I remember I brought it to her, and she goes, oh, yeah, I guess it works. I'm like, well, you got to wait for the study. <laughs> <laughs> They've been doing this for hundreds of years, you right, know? Right. So there, there's got to be some, and so there's got to be some balance with this kind of stuff, and you got to consider all of these things before making your decisions, and also realize that we don't know a lot.
Yeah. Like there's a lot that we don't know. So when I see the, like my favorite ones are the, or my favorite ones to poke holes in are the dairy ones, the meat ones, like, oh, meat causes this. Well, God, for so long we've been hammered that meat is bad for us, that a larger percentage of health conscious people avoid red meat now. Mm -hmm. So how can you separate the two? By the way, red meat has been considered healthy and nutrient dense for thousands and thousands of years, almost every culture. So now all of a sudden it's bad for you. I yeah. don't know about that. Now all of a sudden we need, yeah, like vegetable, meat, and insects. Like yeah. Yeah, that's how we need to survive. Now. It's so ironic to me because it's such a luxury to even think this way. Because I was, I binge watched the latest Alone uh, season oh, this weekend again. Uh, I'm like, I think I'm on the latest one is where I'm at. But, and I just, I can't help it. It's like the perfect example of like, this is how we evolved. <laughs> and it, it, and you see the people In struggling the who are eating crickets and pulling up uh, onion, onion, bul onion bulbs and berry shrubs yeah. and stuff like that. Like the ones that don't get, don't kill the deer, that don't catch the fish, that don't get the wolverine, that don't get these, <laughs> didn't get this meat. They're fucked. They're always <laughs> fucked. They never, they never get past a couple weeks, you dude. You have calories. And like, it's no like, way. how could you watch that show and not think like, this is how we got here. I mean, yeah, this yeah. is, we now we're in this, this great p place where you go to the grocery store and even if a, a, a fruit or vegetable or something is not in season or your state can't even grow it, dude, you could still eat it. I I remember getting yeah. a big debate. I had a uh, I had a client once who was like, yeah, "Do you do you grill your food?" I'm like, well, "Yeah, sometimes." Like, Ugh. "Well, you know that yeah. that grilling food With creates carcinogen, carcinogen, carcinogen from the flame." Yeah. I'm like, "You know, we grilled our food forever up until recently, where we had yeah. all this technology, we could yeah. <laughs> cook it differently." So I don't mm. know. And then mm. salmonella, or yeah. you know, and also that doesn't necessarily mean it's it's bad, not necessarily. And so then, we, and then I said, well, let me ask you a question. I said, do you think it's better to have vegetables raw or cooked? He goes, well, raw because when you cook it, you destroy the nutrients. I said, yeah, but you don't absorb them. You ever try to eat a bunch of raw vegetables? <laughs> I said, why don't you eat a rock? There's hella minerals in the rock. You're not going to absorb those either. So we got to look at the whole picture. But it's just all it's a constant uh, it's a constant discussion, and it's interesting because um, supplement companies. People who sell books, uh, politicians, you know, food companies, if they have a, an agenda, they could take something and use it in a way to which, manipulate the conversation. Which, by the way, I wish yeah. I remember the number. I want to say it's like 80 something percent. Maybe Doug can fact check me on this of studies that are put out there. There's there's a a financial incentive yeah. for the company that's pushing that study out, which of course, understandably, that's how studies have to get done because nobody's just throwing money at all these random studies. So it's normally got to be somebody yeah, who wants that, to prove a that point. That means lots of other things aren't being studied, like alternative uh, right. medicine. Exactly. Right. Who's going to study things that you can't patent and sell? Or at right. least who's going to fund that? Because what am I going to get out of, the, out of funding this million dollar study? Okay, it turns out that, you know, goji berries are phenomenal for blood pressure or whatever. Well, okay, now what? What am I going to do? But with, but where do I get my million dollars back? I'd rather take the compound out of goji berry, uh, synthesize it, change it a little bit so I can patent it, and then I'll do that study because now I have something to sell. Totally. Right? So that's, this is all stuff you need to consider. So You see this, yeah. the percentage on that, Doug? I know it's high. <clears throat> up to 75%. 75, yeah. okay. So I knew You know which, I, I which knew studies are the worst? Uh, psychology and behavior. Yeah, they can't ever replicate that. They're almost they're, they're, almost always they they can't replicate. Yeah, that. I think it's I think that's up above eighty or ninety percent can't be duplicated and stuff. But then again, I mean that also that also highlights when you're talking about psychology, right? Like it, human behavior and the in, how individual all of us are and complex. Yeah, and exactly. I mean, you're talking the brain and the metabolism to yeah. the which is why too. I mean, and I know that's metabolism is directly in our space, but that's why I'm so skeptical of so many studies because it's like. We, it's studying the metabolism is kind of like studying our, our universe right now. It's like arguing. I think we know more about the universe, to be honest with you. Yeah, it's a, that's how that's how many unknowns there are. So when you get people that start to like tout all these facts because a new PubMed study is like, stop it. Yeah, stop it. Like we can't. We don't even know that. Much I had. About I it. actually. So I was in L.A. Friday, right? And I was on a couple podcasts. One of them was Max Lugavier, one of our one of our friends' favorite people. And we were talking about the people who are like, it's all about calories, and people like calories don't exist. And I'm like, you know, the thing about the, this whole calories in versus calories out thing, like I get why there's people who say that it doesn't exist. And I get why there's people who are like, this is all that matters. I said, but the people that say it doesn't exist, it's because we don't realize that our calories out part, our metabolism, it literally adjusts all day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
it's always adjusting to try to find homeostasis or to keep us alive. So it's not like my body burns 2000 calories a day. Yeah. Even if yeah. I measured today, it, it did. <laughs> yeah, exactly. If I measured it today, it's not mathematical one plus one. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. If I measured it right now with very sophisticated technology, that answer means that that's what I did now. Right. Tomorrow, I don't know, I could get in a bad mood or I could, you know, sleep differently, get different sunlight, take whatever, eat something. To, and then that'll change. That number's going to change. And it, and I, I think we, it's, more dramatic than we realize you take somebody that has had all the most sophisticated stuff to measure and and say that and then that same exact person doesn't eat for an extended period of time. something very stressful happens in their life they didn't sleep but maybe four to six hours that night <laughs> boy i bet that that metabolism is running completely different one day yeah one day like that one day it. yeah i know yeah so it's just like this idea that we when we when we get one of these studies that come out that point and it, I think too that we have to be careful because I think you get labeled as like also more like anti science. I'm like definitely yeah. not anti science no, no. because I think that's a it, it definitely should show like oh there's something here for us to look into or pay attention to. How about this? Focus on what we know. Yeah. What do we know? Um, if you do strength training properly, you'll build some muscle and you'll speed up your metabolism. Uh, being active is better than not being active. Don't overeat. Right. Stick to whole natural foods. Um, you know, tr uh, treat people nicely. Like these are all things we know. Like why don't we just focus on that stuff? And then all these little, you know, pieces that we keep, you know, trying to pull out to strengthen our bias or our political position where it's like, come on, that's ridiculous. Yeah, the that nuances are just talking points to kind of sway you into some kind of marketing uh, funnel. I mean, for the most part in our space, you know, and it's they're masterful at finding those one or two uh, pieces of studies that, that help to support uh, whatever method yeah. they're using. Oh, another point, too, when I was with Max, we were talking about mTOR. And he goes, what do you think about people saying, you know, that eating too much protein stimulates mTOR, mTOR feeds cancer? I'm like, you know what else feeds cancer? Like all the food that you eat if you have cancer. <laughs> like <laughs> you got to look at context. It makes a big difference, you know? Yeah. Anyway, it's pretty funny. Boom. What's up, everybody? Two days left for the massive, the biggest sale we've done all year long. It turned out to be huge. So many people signed up for this. Only two days left. Here's what's on sale. The RGB bundle. 50% off. MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, MAPS Aesthetic, bundled together, discounted, took an additional 50% off. And then we also have MAPS Suspension. It's a suspension trainer program. That's also 50% off. Only 48 hours left to take advantage of this particular sale. So if you're interested, go to mapsfitnessproducts.com and then use the coupon code JULY50. Also, I'm going to give those away for free to one viewer. Okay, so one of you will get both all that for free. Here's how you can win. Leave a comment below in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Subscribe to this channel and click on notifications. If we like your comment, we'll notify you in the comment section and you'll get all of that for free. All right, here comes the show. Okay, I got to tell you guys. Uh, so Gio comes in, right? So this is one of our editors. I didn't tell you guys, so I want to tell you guys on the show. You want to hear what happened to him yesterday? How crazy this was? What? So he lives in the Mission uh, District of San, San Francisco, Francisco, right? So last night in front of his house, he said there was like a block party or something. And they were just rowdy. <laughs> On a Sunday? Yeah. Random. He said they were rowdy. They were doing donuts in front. Like just what? crazy. And he's like, he was in his house, couldn't sleep, loud as hell. And he was contemplating going outside, telling him to shut up, right? Now, Gio, great guy, super nice guy. He's also, a, I think he's a brown belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, pretty tough guy or whatever. So, but then he's like, I'm glad I didn't. I'm like, what happened? He goes, another rival group or something drives through and just start spraying bullets throughout what? the neighborhood. Bullets went through his house. What? Oh my yeah, God. dude. What? Bullets went through his house. He was showing me pictures. Is this San Francisco? San Francisco. Wow. Bro, is it that is it that crazy there that like that could happen on a Sunday night? Cops not get it's called like and show up to Bro, like Bro, he was showing me all the 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 what is it? The bullet shells or whatever. It was like hundreds of rounds. He's like literally machine guns. They there was a party there, and some rival group. This is what the police said. Some rival group drives through, and he just brr, 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 and it's going through his walls, dude. Could you imagine that, what, dude? I'm out of there. Hey, could you imagine? Like, I'm gonna go out there and say something. Like, thank God you go out there, bro. Right? Yeah. You ain't gonna throw an arm bar on them bullets. They're gonna. <laughs> wow. That <laughs> happened to him last night. Last night, bro. on a Sunday night. So he walks in. He's like, oh, rough night. And I'm thinking, like, oh, what happened, man? Did you go out late? You know, late, whatever. He's like, yeah. no, dude. He goes, <laughs> bullets flying through. <laughs> we like, oh, where do you live, dude? <laughs> Are you in Afghanistan? What's a going gang on? war right outside my uh, door. There, right huh? outside, dude. Jeez. And he showed me pictures. He's got bullet holes through his wall. Wow. Yeah, we'll put them up on the on the video here. What's the is is San Francisco still bleeding people? Do we know? Yeah. Are they? Yeah, I read an article that showed that of the big cities, it was fared one of the worst. 
So all the, a lot of the big cities did really bad during the pandemic. Of course. But San Francisco did really, uh, apparently really bad. And people are upset about the, uh, the business climate there, which it's always been a complaint, but I guess it got real bad. And the uh, crime. The crime. Remember how we know we've been talking about the crime. But Gavin there. Newsom taxed successful businesses, so we're fine. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, we're good. <laughs> Dude, uh, re- retailers leaving San Francisco because they don't persecute um, shoplifters. Mm-hmm. And then- Prosecute? Yeah, they don't prosecute. Is that, right. is that persecute. Oh, sorry, prosecute. Oh, I said yeah. prostitute. And, yeah. Yeah, no, not prostitute. Okay. Prosecute. <laughs> good. We're, we're all on the same page We're on now. the same page. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then also the car theft, the smash and grab, it's so bad. I think I told you guys- You'll see cars with their, they'll leave their windows open with nothing in their car, so people could just search. Isn't there a bunch of controversy right now with uh, Starbucks yeah. uh, pulling out on all kinds of cities like this? Oh, what was that? Did you not read oh, that? Oh, yeah, no. Starbucks leaving. That. Starbucks leaving a bunch of cities. I think San Francisco is up they there. Were, with one. Yeah, they were actually. Wasn't it the uh, CEO that came out and said he was yes. pulling them out of like certain cities that were run by um, you know mayors that allowed a lot of this to, wow. to occur? Mm-hmm. Yeah, a lot of yeah, liberal Seattle, cities. Los Angeles, Portland, Oregon, uh, Philadelphia, and Washington. Oh, San Francisco's not on there. I don't see it. Now, oh. why was he pulling out? Was it because they were because of the crime? Because of crime, yeah. yeah. Yeah, well. And they weren't, I mean, uh, yeah, they weren't enforcing uh, law and order. Okay, so, I mean, in order to to secure a, a, like a free society, you have to have very, very good law and order because that's what secures you have Otherwise, safety the guy, to, the to guy operate. with the biggest guns runs a show. Yeah. You know what I mean? And if you don't have good, good crime control, you're screwed. Yeah. There's no business. There's no. You can't have good education. You can't do anything. Well, you saw what happened with the Chaz Chop up there. Like, oh, yeah, that that was pretty crazy. I wonder if that is it still like. No, it got shut all down. Okay, so that all just imploded. Yeah, uh, and, and I think there's a big joke about it, right? Like all the all the businesses that were in that area left, left yeah. and like it just totally decimated that area. Oh like, man, like, this it, was, was it a sucked, stupid dude, idea. Because I love Seattle. Like I w- I went up there. I remember like after. Um, all was said and done. They were just so happy to have anybody there like shopping and going in their businesses. Wow. And it's like the business owners were just, you know, suffering through this whole thing. Yeah. They, they, um, when you look historically at areas where stuff like this has happened, it takes decades for them. And sometimes they don't recover Yeah, because once businesses leave, there's no investment in there and everything else just starts to go to crap. Well, since you brought up the Geo story, that sounds like it's something out of a movie. Uh, I saw something that reminded me of something out of uh, the movie Seven. Remember the uh, the I can't remember which which part of, God, of that movie was disturbing. Oh, such dude. a good that movie. Was so ending disturbing. just killed me. Dude. Such a good movie. One of the best movies oh, of all time. Right? Can we agree on that? Yeah. Can we agree? It's like yeah, it one, was of the, one of the better ones. One right? of the best movies yeah. of all time. If you've never seen Seven, you have to watch it. Anyways, I saw this article. Uh, a woman in UK was found dead in her apartment. Two years. And rent was being collected. What? How, how was she paying rent? I have no idea. Was I had it on auto pay. Maybe, yeah, maybe yeah. it was like she was pull state. up, pull it up, Doug. Two year, two year. I mean, I'm sure you go maybe woman dead, two years rent. UK paying rent. It, it must have been the nobody state. came and checked up on her. Yeah, two years. No they had to send. Members. They had to send a, a, a dental to be able to, f- to figure out who she was. Wow. Oh, oh. Yes, she was all two years, bro. Well, yeah, rotting for two years. That's Remember in crazy. seven where he imagine had- if you're the neighbor. Like God, you gotta uh, say something about that. Uh, they gotta fix their apartment. Something smells in there. Do you remember the yeah. remember in in yeah. seven where he had all the air fresheners and stuff like that? They Bro, were how with... that's so sad. Like she had no friends and, uh, for two was, years. Yeah, you to know? not know. Dude, you if find I was depressing. Yeah, the landlord actually cut off gas and kept taking rent. She lay dead in the house for two years. I bet he feels like an idiot now. Uh, He's that... like, well, she never canceled. I don't know. That's <laughs> 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 on her. <laughs> She's not going to need the money. It must have been on like an auto pay, right? It must have been some sort of an auto pay. Wow. Yeah, I don't see that. I mean, it almost sounds like he knew she was dead. I don't know. Dude, well, that's oh. why. It, I, that's why. You ever, hey, you ever hear the stories of people who collect, they'll collect like social security or disability payments on their elderly parent or, you know, someone they take care oh, of, they'll yeah. die mm-hmm. and they'll just like hide the and, body so they can keep collecting. Right. Have yeah. you heard of these? I've oh heard about that. that is messed that is up. That's shady as hell. I tell you what, dude, if I disappeared for longer than three hours, my mom would know. That's, <laughs> that's just a Sicilian mom right there. Hey, what are you doing right now? Hey, you better answer me. If you don't answer me in five minutes, I'm going to send you. Oh, yeah. I'm working, mom. Jesus Christ. <laughs> what do you want me to do? Isn't that crazy, Doug? That is wow. crazy. Right? That's insane. Like how that could even happen, both on the neighbors, like you bring up, two on so like family. How are no family members knowing? And then three, the guy who's collecting rent, like never once thought to like check up. Well, he cut off her gas. Yeah. Why would you cut off somebody's gas? 
if you thought they needed it. And he it. never went by the apartment? That sounds he's like, hey, very he's like, suspicious. Sound like he's like, he's, what a freeloader. I cut her gas off, and she's still not even saying anything. Whatever. <laughs> yeah, dude. I, I call bullshit on that guy. Dang. I wonder what that looked like when you walk in. Uh, like how, what does a body look like two years in bro, an apartment? You, yeah, you need, a, you need a dentist to be able to tell you who she is? Oh. I mean, that means everything's probably be... decayed, and it's just nothing Give but... Give me a whole hazmat suit and everything. Do they man. have a picture I, of her? No, I'm just kidding. No, 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 no. Don't do that. I don't want to see anyway, do that. Dude, I got to tell you, dude... Uh, I, I love this stage of of development with my with my baby son. Yeah, you're at the fun. They go through they there's like these periods where they advance so quickly. It's insane. Like yeah. he said, like he's saying like words just out of nowhere, popping them up like crazy. Like we were looking at something in a book, and he's like, "Wow!" I'm like, "Did you just say wow?" And then right now, Jessica sends me a video where he said <laughs> whale. I'm like he knows what that is. He's like saying words out of nowhere, yeah. and it's fun to watch. It makes me not want to leave because when I leave, I come back and he says new stuff, and I feel no, like yeah, I'm yeah, yeah. a whole new. Sort what, of what's that, what, what are you guys at right now? How far? He's twenty twenty. I think he'll be twenty one months soon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I felt like I felt like once you hit that one year mark, I really do like. And of course, every kid's a little bit different. Like some kids walk a little sooner or progress a little bit faster, but, but it's like spurts. It's not like well, you remember that. Remember that documentary that we all watched yeah. on Netflix. I was that was a really fascinating documentary to watch where they talked about how the child development and that's actually what happens, right? They have these these crazy these spurts, spurts, or also yeah. they grow two, three inches in a night or whatever. Yeah. Or they, I feel like the learning process is the same way too. Max is the same thing. All of a sudden, he'll he'll put together two or three words, and I didn't even know he could say those words wow. or knew what that meant. It's so great. It's so fun to watch, dude. Yeah, yeah. And I um. We're doing this. Obviously, he's got a baby sister coming soon, right? So we've been really good about, and I did this with my older son. I involve him a lot, and he was never jealous of his sister because he was always a part of the whole process. Like he yeah. would hand me the diaper when it was time to change your diaper. He would help me dress her. He would watch her, and so you know we never got that jealousy. So we're doing, we're already prepping Aurelius, and we got him little stuffed animals. And I say it's the baby, and this is how you take care of baby. And he got him a stroller, so he pushes around. So now he's like all into it. Like he's got, we bought. Uh, newborn diapers. I forget how small they are, by the way. We were looking at them the other day. I'm like, oh my God, I forgot how small <sighs> newborns are. But anyway, he wants them. He wants the diapers to put on his little stuffy. So he's putting a newborn diaper on all this. Stuff. So I can't wait to see. How I he is think with that sister. is, I think that is yeah. such a parent hack. So we're, you, you know, we're obviously a little bit ahead of you right now, right? We're at, we're at three years. And this was something that even what we were doing it, regardless if we were going to have a second one come yeah. along or not, that the idea was just to, in, the, 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 you'll, they'll tell you like child development to involve them as much as possible. Yeah. Right. So Max helps Katrina cook. He helps me do yard stuff. He helps me wash cars. He does like, and it's so cool to see that training early on when they're, they're kind of getting into it to where now it's such a hack. So he was like, he spent the night at his aunt and uncle's. He didn't. He didn't sleep at all. They pulled like an all nighter with them. They had a blast with them. Of course, we get him the next day when yeah, he's tired. Mm -hmm. Yeah, tired and cranky yeah. and stuff like that. And he was being a little cranky about something like that. I said, "Hey, you want to go outside and help Daddy? I gotta pick up poop." Yeah, yeah. Uh, like yeah. just excited. And for the next half hour, he's. I got the plastic bag and he's bending over and he's picking it up and yeah. like he just he totally wants to be an adult and a part of adult things. That they also feel like they get to contribute to the family. Oh, you can see it, and you can see it now from the you know the last year of trying to implement that in a lot of things that Katrina and I would do. It's starting to pay pay us forward because it's like, oh wow, here's this little cranky kid that was getting all fussy about the toy he was playing with, and initially I pulled him out of that. I said, okay, let's go work. And the fact that he's like, yeah, and I'm like, oh wow, this is a great hack. You know yeah, no, Jessica's with that particular. She's so good, and we had this conversation because uh, like a while ago, where you know I'm doing a chore, like let's say washing the dishes, and I'm trying to get him out of the way so I could do it real fast, so I could go play with him. And she's like, have him help you. She's mm -hmm. like, that is play. So I'm like, oh my god, what an idiot! It's a hundred percent right. Like, why mm -hmm. why am I hurrying up to do this thing so I can go play blocks with him? Yeah, when all I got to do is make this part of the play. It takes longer, but what's the difference? So I'll hand him a fork, put it over here for me, buddy, and then he helps out. And it's like, and they get to contribute, you know? So yeah, it's all about how you present it. I had to learn that, especially with my kids. It's like, you know, like telling them, I, I could really use your help, you guys, with this. Like that goes way further with them than just being like, do this. Do this. And yeah. I need you to do that. Yeah. You know, and like it's it's all like inclusive and then they feel like they're contributing. So like I, I have to like constantly remind myself like the presentation is everything and the response is exactly how what i'm going to get you know based on my presentation so funny i have a story that you just reminded me of that just happened too this last weekend 
So uh, we all know that I've brought up the dishwasher thing with the silverware, right? Oh, yeah. It's been like a big joke. On Most the valuable thing you've ever said. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody, All like, the stuff yeah. you said. We wrote that one down. That's the yeah. one you get the most comments <laughs> on. It's, it is 100%, right? That's All your, your fitness expertise. Advice right there. It's the dishwashing yeah. stuff. So what What I don't think I've ever shared on the show it, in regards to that, too, is just that like Katrina doesn't give a shit about that stuff. And it's been like... Is I, I always know if she did the dishes in the daytime because I'll open it up and sure shit, they're all mixed together. Yeah. I'm just like, like, and then I'll normally go and fix them, whatever. So the last like three times that I've been doing dishes, I've actually noticed when I open the dishwasher, they're all organized. So I said something to her today or this weekend. And I said, hey, I just want to let you know that uh, I noticed that you're making an effort with the silverware to organize it. I appreciate that. I, I do. And yeah. so that, and she goes, it's not me, it's Max. <laughs> 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 I was like, she oh, did. fuck. Here I thought she was like, oh, like she's really trying to help me out here and stuff like that. She's like, no, nah, Max just puts it all, <laughs> all organized like that. So you're going to be outnumbered, lady. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no. You'll be older than once he gets older. He'll be telling her. Oh, I said, oh, like, I'll take it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Whatever. I'll Dude, take it. Hey, talking about well, li life lessons, I got to tell you this funny yeah. uh, realization I had. I was on Facebook and I think it was Facebook and I belong to these like martial arts pages and they'll have like, Martial Bro, how challenge. many groups are you part of? <laughs> a lot. You have like a, a mold culture, you know, like a scientific Bro, group. Bro, this yeah. is, it's a hack. I'm telling you right okay. now, I don't have to search for anything. They do it for me. Booger sculpture group. Yeah. No, not that. Okay. That's weird. Yeah. Where'd that come from? I don't know. Just... All right. Anyway, so I'm going through. <laughs> trying to remember. And I there's this page I belong to, Martial Arts, and they'll show like, you know, versus fights. Like, you know, boxing versus this, that versus whatever, right? So there was this video of this Aikido master against this uh, submission wrestler. Mm. And I know I already know what's going to happen. Yeah, submission wrestler is going to kick his ass. Well, anyway, I watched it and it was like super fast, beat his ass or whatever. And then there's a debate underneath. And it made me realize, like the reason why the Aikido guy got his ass kicked is because modern Aikido, they never train full contact. Really, that's all it is. They just don't train hard full contact. And then it made me realize like this is like business. It's like, all how many theatrical. People, well, it's like how many people learn business yeah. stuff in school it's and theory, in textbooks. Dude. Yeah. But they they go out in the real world yeah. and the entrepreneur that went out and did it, it's like getting the street fighter versus the guy that, you know, that Read punches a bunch in of the air and hits it and it's a heavy <laughs> bag but never actually gets in a fight, right? Yeah. Right. Like you got to go out and do it because the full contact part is where you learn the most. And, you know, that's why boxers are such That's why the Mike Tyson different. quote is so yeah. famous and so epic. Yeah. Everybody has a plan to get punched in the face. So it's yeah. like business. It's like you talk to somebody who's got this education in business and they'll tell you like, well, you know, the business cycle and this and that. It's like, how many businesses have you owned? Oh, zero? Yeah. yeah. It's like, how many fights have yeah, you been way in? Way too em much emphasis on the business plan and, and like oh, yeah. get just hung up on that. What are your that's, business plans? What are your KPIs? Like, that's what you get yeah, from somebody like, like that. you get all this like... <laughs> And then it deters a lot of people from making the next steps necessary. And, and they're so afraid of failure that they're not even going to invest themselves fully into well, it. Well, again, to bring it back, it'd be like saying, you know, I want to be a, uh, I want to be a good fighter, but I don't want to go out and get in a fight. So what if I get hit in the face? Yeah. So I hate to break this to you, <laughs> you're but gonna you're going to have face. to get your ass kicked a bunch before you become a good fighter. Just yeah. like with business, you're going to have to go out and fail. That's like part of the process. Right, right. You ain't going to go out and succeed right out the gate. It doesn't work that way. Well, that's right. what I love about the whole McDojo page where it kind of exposes so a lot of the old like uh, legendary lore and mysticism behind a lot of these like martial arts. Dude, where, you know, like, I got so many stories because Steven when I Seagal when I did jujitsu was God. It's been it's got to be it's almost twenty years now that I haven't done Brazilian jiu-jitsu. So back then, jujitsu was a little bit less known or whatever. And we would every once oh, in a I'd while. Oh, I'd say it's, it was a lot less known. It's it, gotten really popular in the last Even then, though, years. more people knew. But you're right. It's Now it's like <laughs> yeah. everywhere. But anyway, I, I remember people would come in from other styles that where they never trained, like full contact. And they would say some of the stuff. So I remember one time this guy comes in and he did, I don't remember what it was. It was Kung Fu or something like that. And again, never fights, never really trains full contact. And he challenges the instructor. And he says, you know, um, he goes, I want you to go against me and then I'll try and do moves on you that I've learned that are lethal, but I won't make them lethal. And I remember I can see the instructor. <laughs> okay, <laughs> buddy. Moves. So anyway. The five finger death touch. So anyway, the instructor's <laughs> like, he's like, all right. So the instructor, of course, what do you do? He takes him down, chokes him out, right? Now, yeah. while he's choking him out, he feels this like Kung Fu guy or whatever tapping on his head with his fingers <laughs> like this. So then when he lets go and the guy taps out, he goes, yeah, I could have, I could have totally ripped your eyeball out. Uh -huh. And he goes, what? He goes, yeah, I was tapping on your head to let you know that I could have plucked your eyeball out. Wow. 
And he goes, if you if you poked my eyeball out while I was choking you, I would have choked you till you died. Yeah. <laughs> we were all cracking. <laughs> like, he might lose an eye. You're dead, bro. <laughs> so, that, but it was funny because then again, he says, "All right, let's go again. This time, go ahead and poke my eyeball out." And sure enough, he choked him out again. It was just, <laughs> <that's a good laughs> yeah, dude. It was, uh, was, was going to rip your eyeball. Oh, bro. So much shenanigans. I was with that. Anyway, so uh, did you guys hear about? You know how they're talking about that a recession might happen. Well. It's not going to happen. <laughs> Wait a second. Wait. We're in a recession. How are we, oh. how are we spinning this? No. More? Recession's not happening. Oh, good. They changed the definition of recession. <laughs> Is that true? <laughs> yeah, dude. Yeah. No, no worries. way. They no changed, worries. Let me read to you. Just all undercover, too. Dude, because, this is so funny. If well, you first of all, okay, wait. So first of all, you tell the audience, a, the, the true definition of a recession is two quarters back to back. Of okay? negative growth. So in other words, six months in a row of negative GDP. It's always been that. Yeah. That's been the definition forever. Yeah. Okay. This was on whitehouse.gov, the official White House website. It says, mm. while some maintain that two consecutive quarters of falling real GDP con constitutes a recession, that is neither the official definition nor the way economists evaluate the state of the business cycle. Really? Mm. It is unlikely that the decline in GDP in the first quarter of this year, even if followed by another GDP decline in the second quarter, indicates a recession. Mm. This is under... What is a recession in whitehouse.gov? So now they can come out and say, now we're not in a recession because we changed the definition. Well, so now I know. Okay. <laughs> so I when know. does changing the definition uh, equate lies? Well, Bro, here's, that's just like, like, how do we, yeah. How so here's what, here's what some economists are saying though, about that. And, and I'm going to play the other side just so people understand like where that's coming from is we had it. We had a, a, a two month negative GDP at the beginning of the pandemic. Yeah. And then we came out of that and we had this crazy surge. Sure. And when they do the numbers of growth on GDP, it's compared to prior year. Sure. So we had, we went from, you know, two months of, or two quarters of negative GDP. Then we go into the skyrocketing, crazy right. growth in the GDP. And now we're back to this year. And now we see in Q1, Q2, we see negative GDP in comparison to previous year, sure. which saw abnormal growth because of the, the pandemic. So the argument that they're trying to make or what some economists are trying to say is that when you look at the total average, let's say we look at a, a five-year running average, we're fine. We're right on pace. We're still, GDP is still overall still, growing. Uh, it's just that you would you would expect that after a, say, because uh, I don't remember what the exact number is, but I want to say it's somewhere around 4% growth in GDP that we had of that rebound when everything got inflated like crazy over the last year and a half. Now we're coming back down to earth and coming down to back to earth when comparing to previous year looks like negative GDP, but it's not. Yeah, but that's so here's why that's ridiculous. First off, it's still a recession because recession means we're going backwards. So regardless right. of how fast we went forward, we're still going backwards. And also, if anything, that indicates a bigger problem. So to, to that's put what it, I think. Right. So to put in to put like give you an analogy, it would be like somebody coming to you and be like, hey, look. I just gained 20 pounds in the last week, but I'm still down 15 pounds because I lost 35 pounds last month. You as a trainer would be like, hold on a second. Yeah, we're heading the wrong mm -hmm. direction. You, you might still be down 15 yeah. based on but what the hell is going on. You gained 20 in the last week. No, that's, week. A, that's a great yeah. analogy, Sal, because in, in the grand scheme of things, we, you know, we're okay, you're not bad, but this, there's some serious signs that totally. we're heading in the wrong direction. And if we continue down this path, it could get worse. And if anything, it shows that that fast explosive growth was, there was some skewed signals and some shit that was going on. I think the, the thing that I'm watching uh, in regards to all this conversation that's, that's, and I brought it up on the show a while ago. I was under the impression that it was $1,000. I was wrong. It was like $700-something is the new average of a car payment, okay. which is the highest it's ever been, sure. right? It's never still, been that high before. Crazy. And the amount of debt that's being carried on, on cars right now is crazy. And I didn't know this, but there was little to no regulation around the loans that were being given out for a lot of these cars. So we had this huge explosion because of the the, the yeah. um, chips that weren't getting over at this high, this explosion of demand for vehicles. So the prices which, were Which up. drove the prices dramatically up. I sent you over the car on the cat. It was like $40,000 increase yeah, on a, a vehicle. It's crazy. Yeah. It's, it's insane how high people were paying over MSRP and that the banks were actually approving these loans. So we are actually about to see something very similar that we saw in the housing market happen in the car market. Mm -hmm. So you have a bunch of people right now driving around cars. They bought last year at a 20 to 30% over MSRP that now have loans 
that are on a car that is not worth you know, 30, 40, 50 grand the price okay, that they're so paying Okay, so to put this loan. in perspective, you buy a brand new car off a lot, it automatically loses value anyway. But now you can add an additional 20% to that. And so you have a situation where people are going to look at their loans, be like, why don't I just dump this car and not pay back this loan because I could get another one for- That's right. Now, here's the deal. And it, it, car loans are market-based. And the reason why they give out a loan is they, they can always repo the car. Here's the And that's okay. That's how market's correct. Here's the problem. If this becomes a big enough issue, it could become politically expedient to come out and be a politician and say, hey, everybody, losing your cars. We That's need what to, I think we need to help everybody out. Yeah. So now we're Let's gonna have more money. We're gonna bail out the car industry <laughs> so that you guys can all keep How your cars. weird is it gonna be when we see that again? How yeah. weird is that gonna be? That's gonna make the car prices else explode can we print even more. Money for? Yeah. The car cars are getting more expensive. If what is that. the consensus on the bailout of the houses? Like is, is it I is are we divided on whether we believe that was a necessary evil or that we should or shouldn't have done it or, or is it is it pretty clear that that was a bad I idea i think that it's clear that it was a bad idea but if you ask the average person then you're going to get some division right but if you look at what happened it exploded the cost of of assets even more and all it did is it pumped it up pumped it up even more and now it's creating maybe potentially a larger problem it also created a larger divide because you have more of the have haves versus the have nots. Now, had they allowed the market to correct, it would have been some pain for sure. But then what would happen is you would have a much more accurate market. So, which is what always happens when we flood a bunch of money into the market, anyways. Yeah. I mean, that's. All, I mean, I, I tried to explain this to somebody the other day about, and I and I told you guys before off air, like the analogy I use is like a monopoly board, and if you have somebody, the haves are the people that own Boardwalk. And the and whatever the green the green pieces and the yeah. the red pieces and they've all got hotels and houses on it and then the you know m m middle class has some properties but they don't have any pro no houses on it yet and then the poor have got no properties or maybe one property like yeah. Mediterranean and they don't even have both of them they can't build any houses on it and they run out of money. Yeah. And you go, hey, we're trying to help you out. We're going to give you a, you know here's you know ten thousand so you can keep playing the game. Well, what ends up happening? They still end up going around, and, and the so, market never corrects. And that's exactly how that's exactly how it is happening in real life right now. The, the The rich have all the assets. The rich have all the companies. They have all the stock in companies. They have all those means, and so it's all and they have, and they all have, it's doing is delaying the process of them being more rich. Right. Well, mm -hmm. not only that, but they don't have any incentive to changing uh, the prices or business because if you okay, so. Politicians got very involved in the housing market because it became this message that was everybody deserves to own a house. This is the American dream. And then they got in and said, hey, if you don't give loans to these people, um, it's because they're underprivileged or because of this or because of that. So we need to guarantee loans. So it's like if I gave you $100,000 to go to Vegas and I said, you know, Justin, here's 100 grand to go to Vegas. By the way, if you lose every penny of it, I'll give it back to you. What are you going to do? You're going to gamble every last cent. Sure. So there was an incentive for banks to do this knowing that they were guaranteed. And the really no, and the market uh, pressures for giving out good or bad loans, the, they were all skewed, right? Mm -hmm. The same thing happened with education. Everybody deserves a higher education. So the loans became crazier and crazier. What happened? The price went through the roof, and none of these universities. So they're, so they're saying that this is the same gangster thing that's happening with the cars. Is yeah. that these these banks and these these car companies are doing it, knowing that the worst case scenario, they'll just repo this shit and take it back. Mm -hmm. So they let these people get into these loans, get these cars. They put their so they win no matter what. Either they're going to get somebody who's going to pay 20, 30 percent over MSRP, and they actually pay it down, and then they really went they really went on that loan, or they default after having it for six or seven months because now they don't have a job, yeah. or we're now we're in a recession, and they go repo it and they get it back they go flip it and sell it again it's crazy yeah but then you're going to get a huge enough amount of people losing their cars for it to become like i said politically expedient oh my god you're all losing your car so then i step up like a politician i yeah. go hey everybody i'm gonna make sure you guys get to keep your cars we're gonna come out with this new government program that's going to guarantee that you keep your cars and then what they'll do is they'll make a deal with the auto companies and they'll say our, our tax dollars will print some money and we'll pay some of their loan if you give them a lower rate. And that's the deal they'll work out. Car monkey, the car companies make a lot of money. We inflate the the money supply even more, and we create more problems later. Dude, on. I feel like I'm the only one stressing out about all this stuff, dude. It <laughs> gives me heartburn. <laughs> <laughs> and my gut has been off, dude. The last like few weeks, I, I swear. Yeah. So what's man, going on? Brutal. It's. I think it's just because of vacation, let my hair down, like incorporating some of these like foods that normally I wouldn't eat and, and drink in a little excessively. Like I've just been like 
I've tried to like clean it all up the last week or so. I've been really trying to dial it in. And it's like, man, it's it's such a process. Once you let it get to a certain point, it just gets so inflamed so easy. So any little bit of anything, like I had like one cooking. Yeah, like, you're right. You got to back up yeah, for a while. Yeah, it's awful. So, I mean, I'm I'm dialed it back down. So I'm just like you know, meat veggies. Like I'm like in fasting some of the time too, but, um, like I've, I've been trying to like even increase the bit of, uh, vegetables I'm getting as well. And so I'm like also like doing some green juice in there as well, you know, just to kind of like, cause you know, like we talked to uh, Dr. Terry walls yeah. and like, I remember talking to her about that, about, you know, how m much volume of, of vegetables you really should be intaking every day. And yeah. it's pretty, it's pretty substantial. How dude. are you? She, that conversation we had with her years ago, it was that changed me. That yeah. was when I started to do, like, I remember when we first met Sal and he was like the first person I'd ever seen that would eat like a, a giant bowl of steamed vegetables yeah. Yeah, like, by themselves. Do that, dude. I never had done that before. I do that now. I literally, after, after meeting Sal, seeing that and kind of like, kind of mocking him a little bit over it and laughing but then you're about like, it. But he looks so good. <laughs> That's what it What's was. His here? shits are normal. No, and then I, yeah. and then I remember yeah. us interviewing Dr. Terry Walls, and I remember her talking to just about how much we underconsume um, vegetables, and uh, and then I also too before Sal, I I still was still stuck in the old way as a, like an old trainer of like the butters and oils thing. Like if yeah. I had vegetables, my thought my thought was I needed to steam them. Let's and make it as gross as possible. Yeah, yeah. That's, I mean it was like well that defeats the purpose to put butter and oil. Yeah. Butter and oil is bad for you. Why would I do that? So even though I knew better, I still was stuck in yeah. those old ways of cooking. Yeah, and I'm, I mean I guess seeing you eat that way really gave me that like oh I could throw some bacon in there or I can have some butter totally. on there or oil on there totally. and now I actually really enjoy. Now, it. How does the green juice affect your your digestion? Does oh, it help? Yeah, it helps. Yeah. So what do you helps. do? Like one, like two servings or something a day? Yeah, I'll do two servings. I'll do one in the morning and one, you know, later on in the day. Yeah. Um, even after my meals. So I'm just like kind of making sure I'm getting enough volume. But uh, another thing, um, Courtney's been um, creating her own vegetable garden outside, which has been, you know, fun to see that awesome. all kind of transpire. And uh, what I realized was she actually used like really a high quality soil. Uh, in that. And I didn't realize that would make that much of a difference, but I, I had one of the carrots. So we have these carrots that are, that are growing that are like, you know, white or purple and orange mm -hmm. and different ones. And I had one that was like, I, I bit into it and it was like such a strong carrot flavor. It was like, it's hard to describe, but it was almost like spicy. It was like, oh, it was almost kind of like a ginger kind of a, a wow. aftertaste. And I was like, was it orange? Is this or how they're it... supposed to taste? You know, like it was, was crazy. It, a different color? it was white, mm. but even the orange ones, they all had kind of that similar, like really strong. And I'm, I'm pretty convinced that it's, it has to do with the soil. You know where you see a big difference with that? Just if you ever, anybody watching this, if you want to ever uh, see what a big difference it makes and what your food is fed or how it's grown, get yourself some real pasture raised eggs. Mm -hmm. And then oh, yeah, compare the them to normal conventional. Yeah, the color. Oh, yeah, the first bright all, orange is insane. First of all, the color is weird. The, the conventional ones are pale. Yep. The pasture ones are like this this rich kind of orangish, you know, yolk. And then the shell. Yeah. You get the conventional. The shell it crumbles in your hands like it's paper. The shell on the pasture runs is hard. So that's next that's a big level. ass difference. We're gonna bring the chickens back. You know for what? That reason. You know what other vegetables like that I, is tomatoes. Yeah. I, I oh, remember yeah. no, I, 100 I remember getting my 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 mom's husband has his own organic garden that he grows and he has this he has these tomatoes and they kept telling me oh you gotta have these tomatoes I'm like I'm not a big tomato guy like I'm I'm not a huge like I some in my salad this that but it's kind of like mush for me yeah though. it's kind of whatever I'm not a big they are they were so rich and tasted so amazing. I we Katrina and I would eat them up for dinner by themselves. Yeah. yeah. Slice them up a little balsamic over, yes. over the top of them a little salt. and eat it like a like a meal. It yeah. they were so good. Dude, you guys, was, I got to bring you guys some tomatoes yeah, from my dad's difference. yard. So my dad grew my dad obviously grows a lot of stuff in his but he grows a lot of tomatoes, uh green beans, what else? Eggplant. I got to take you some of the stuff that he grows. Mm -hmm. In the, I could tell a huge difference between his and the ones we get at the store. Yeah. And it's got to be the soil. and So now I see why, like, she's so defensive of, of all. Because, like, you know, between squirrels eating all our fruit and, <laughs> you know, gophers. And, like, dude, it's, it, it's like this weird, like, 
like system of of uh, threats to, that it's just a constant. You know, it's like either like the ants are coming in, or it's like you know the gophers, or like you know some birds, or like deer. Or, you know, we're fighting like Mother Nature out there always, just to try and like reap the bounty. That's why. Of that's, what's why that's why I go to the store and buy it. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot easier. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe I'll buy sure. some of Courtney. Yeah. Speaking of threats, did you guys see the video of the the chess robot? playing the seven-year-old chess like there was this like russian chess champion one of the best in the world under nine did you see what happened no no oh fucked up bro so the chess robot takes a piece and makes a move right and yeah. the kid will make a move well i guess the robot made a move the kid made a move didn't move his hand fast enough the robot went grabbed his hand thinking it was a piece broke his finger <laughs> oh what <laughs> The robot uprising has started. Oh, man. I swear. Already injuring human beings. That really Shut happened? that robot down. broke now. a little kid's finger, dude. Oh, oh my God. Fucking robot. The chess robot. Better dude. melt that robot. Oh, my God. I'm How slow you, does dude. that kid have to be to not see that coming? I, I mean, it <laughs> well, <laughs> Right? I mean, you're making a move. He's still thinking about it. And the robot's mm, coming. Uh, like, yeah. Do you imagine if you saw that? A robot grab your kid and whatever? Oh. Oh my God! Oh, I'm getting dude. an axe out. I, like, who I wonder if that's what like, I bet you, you made this robot. I bet you that's what <laughs> happened, Justin. Is that and I bet you they hadn't programmed that in. Is you know in chess where as soon as you take your hand off of yeah, it, it's yeah, a yeah, move, yeah, right? Yeah. So you probably moved. Yeah, his hand's still in the piece. and his hand was probably still on the piece, and maybe they didn't write that in the code. Yeah. Like, <laughs> but imagine, <laughs> hey, imagine. Okay, fingers. first of all, also like imagine the environment of the whole tournament, right? It's like <laughs> under nine champion kids, parents all watching, everybody's like, oh, they're playing. These really smart machines and a fucking robot breaks a little kid's oh, finger. Man. Oh, the kid's oh, screaming. Can yeah. you imagine? Oh, yeah. Because it won't let go. Yeah. Oh wow. my God, dude. <laughs> dude, that's crazy. It changes the whole thing. So that's the robot. And there's the yeah, kid it's right part. on top. Oh, look, they oh. couldn't get it out. Oh, oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, dude. And they're like trying to pry it. Oh, my oh, God. Oh, little kid. Poor kid. Just like traumatized, dude. He'll never play chess again. Oh, oh, look at that poor God. kid. Oh, my God. You know what, though? You know what this is the beginning? Destroy that robot. Justin, I just yes. thought of like a crazy sci-fi plot right now. Okay. Okay. I've probably already thought of it, but go ahead. In the future. First, yeah. of all, first of all, let me paint the story. Adam, you're going to love this too. Okay. He's a chess champion at seven years old. Obviously, highly intelligent kid, right? right. Mm -hmm. In the future, when the robot uprising happens, mm -hmm. like this kid is going to lead the rebellion. Yeah. And they're gonna go back and be like, when you know, when did this all start for you? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, broke my finger. Broke yeah. my finger, and that was it. I dedicated that was my it. life <laughs> forever to destroy ro all robots, yeah, dude. all robot connections. Yeah. John Connor, yeah. <laughs> Inception. Anyway, yeah, dude. Uh, so I finally got to take the kids out again fishing. So, and what was cool was we uh, we actually connected with Andrew and his kid too. Oh, you guys all went together. And so we all got to I make a that. thing of it. Yeah, I we went to Loch Lomond, uh, and it was like it was great. I was hoping that we'd all like catch fish. And it was going to be this epic outing and whatnot, but you know, it uh, didn't really pan out. Like we had some bites and some action, but literally the the whole time was like. We have to like untangle these kids' lines and redo their rigs, and it's it's it was like I had to check myself quite a few times to not lose my shit, you know, because it was like you have to trust them that they're gonna they're gonna cast correctly, and you teach them the techniques, but it's like you have to let them fail too, right? Yeah. And like tangle up and like do all this and do it all over again, and I felt like I have this whole new respect for like my my grandma, my, my grandpa and everybody like that took me fishing and like dealt with the fact that like, okay, I cast it. I finally got everything correct, but now I get it on the bottom and then I get stuck and then we have well, to yeah. like rip it and do it all. Well, yeah. Day. Cause if you get all frustrated and angry, you're just going to ruin the experience. Ruin the experience. Yeah. Like do you, you think it's more an advantage to be not a big fisherman dude teaching your kids? Or do you think it's a less of an advantage? Cause like, I feel like if you're teaching something that you're very passionate about, you love, you're really good at you probably have a, a... I'd rather somebody else teach it. Yeah. I, well, yeah, because I feel like you would get irritated faster yeah. because it's your, you enjoy doing it. Versus like if I was, if I'm doing, like for example, my son and I doing the puzzles, right? Because he loves the puzzles. Like him messing up or trying the same piece forever, I really don't give a shit. I suck at puzzles. Yeah. Half the time he's faster than I am. Yeah, so it's yeah. just like, whatever, we're doing it together. So I feel like I have all the patience in the world doing that. Mm -hmm. But if I was trying to teach him like basketball, spreading his fingers and this, I'm so into that, that like I could see myself getting more frustrated. So do you think it's an advantage or a disadvantage to not be into God. the thing that you're teaching? I could see one, I could see advantages and disadvantages. Of right? Yeah. yeah. I think you just have to be, remember that the experience that you're creating and have to accept like, <laughs> 
I'm not here for me. I'm here for them. Mm -hmm. But boy, I, I could see the frustration too, right? Because right? if you show them they're frustrated, like I have a That's going to turn them off, right? Dude, I have a friend whose yeah. dad was a high level soccer player, very, very high level soccer player. And he was such, he was so frustrated with his kid trying to teach, teach him soccer that by the time this kid was like 12, he, and now he's an adult. When he's 12, he's like, I don't want to play soccer ever again because his dad made it such a bad experience. Mm -hmm. Well, now as an adult, he's like, man, I had so much talent. He goes, but I quit because my dad made me hate it so much. He goes, yeah. had he not done that, I would have totally played. Well, yeah, I mean, and I and I had to catch myself because Everett actually caught me like like f like messing with the line. I'm like, ugh, ugh, and I'm like getting pissed that I was like, you know, having to unravel everything and like start over and and get it under the bail and like, and so I he was like, Dad, I see you're you know you're getting frustrated. You know, don't worry about it. And like he was about to do his own. Wow. I'm like, I'm like no, no. Like I'm just only frustrated with what I'm doing right now. It has nothing to do with you. You know, like uh, this, this is just me trying to work my way through and I'm processing it. And so anyway, it was total like, um, uh, like lesson for me, bro. When your kids call you out, it's like, Oh yeah. Bro. I remember one was, time my son did that to me. He's like, uh, uh, dad's hands just weren't made for petite things. son. So, but yeah, I mean like, so I asked them later, I'm like, would you guys want to try this again? They're, they're all about it. Oh, that's so I was good. like, Oh, thank oh, God. God. That's good. good. You know, totally fine. Like, yeah. You no, know, it's bad when they're just like, no, nah, it's okay. Okay, dad. Yeah, yeah. No, dad. We're gonna sit this one out, but, dad. You know, dad. I don't want to because I don't want to disappoint you. Just make you crush you. Uh, yeah. Oh God, what did I, I, I do? I know. <laughs> oh, that would have been horrible. But yeah, it turned out to be fun. Hey, sorry to interrupt, but check this out. We have a seriously irresistible offer from one of our sponsors. Buy Optimizers is offering all of our listeners a free bottle of their best-selling digestive enzyme supplement called. Masszyme, so it helps you break down proteins, fats, carbohydrates, helps with bloating, digestion, helps you absorb more amino acids. No joke, you can get a free bottle and nothing else. You don't have to sign up for a continuity program. They're not going to subscribe you to anything. You just get a free bottle. Crazy offer, only while supplies last. So here's how you can get this. Go to masszymes.com. So that's M-A-S-S-Z-Y-M-E-S.com forward slash mind pump free to claim your free bottle of Masszymes, again, while supplies last. All right, here comes the rest of the show. Our first caller is Gary from California. Gary, what's happening, man? How can we help you? Hey, guys, thank you so much for uh, taking my call today. I appreciate it. Really enjoy the show. This question was actually um, submitted back in April, and then because of my school schedule, I was never really able to get anything hooked up. But um, my question was, so... Um, Prior to that, I had reached out to you guys on social media. I'm a PE teacher. Uh, I teach middle school. And um, at that time, you know, because we were in the pandemic, I was teaching online. And I remember, Sal, you had said that uh, your son was upstairs. You could hear him banging around up there doing burpees and uh, hit type training. And so that was kind of what I was doing and giving my students links to videos and stuff. So I just said, hey, well, what would you suggest we, we do with our students. And so you said prime, prime pro. Um, fast forward, then we get in person and um, I was trying to work on a little bit of that stuff, you know, maybe just some general 90-90, a little bit of combat stretch. Um, but my question is, I have access to, at our school, some um, about six TRX straps. And another uh, episode, I had heard you guys talking to, to a caller who said that they had got their daughter into um, a little bit of working out. You mentioned, you know, the suspension trainers and using those types of things. So, again, I have access to that. I have access to some of those Kaiser air machines, light dumbbells. And so, along with all of the um, traditional sports that we do, I try to do some sort of um, a couple of days a week fitness training. So I want to know how, you know, uh, I could incorporate that. And also in the, in the meantime, since the question I have purchased, uh, maps, um, uh, symmetry. Boy. Yes. I'm sorry. Map symmetry. Sorry about that. Um, and I was curious, you know, cause how Justin's doing with his uh, players with the isometric training. So as a teacher, how would you try to incorporate all that from your points of view? Yeah. Now this is, your, this is a class, right? So this is not a, a sports team. This is a, just a PE class. Mm -hmm. How many kids? I, actually, I, I do actually do both. I coach and I teach, but mainly, uh, so I would use them for both, but a lot of 
the question was for my students. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, mm-hmm. see, it's going to be different from each one. And, and the general, in my experience, general uh, fitness for middle school kids right now is not super great. Uh, so we're not dealing with a lot of athletes. It's a lot of kids who probably spend a lot of time on electronics and, and you know, don't do a lot of physical oh, yeah, activity. Absolutely. Is, w- would you say that's accurate? Oh, absolutely. Okay. So that being said, and, and you're doing a class, you're going to have to keep it very basic, mainly because that's what's going to be appropriate, <clears throat> but also because you're working with so many kids, it'll be very hard to monitor anything more than basic um, with a class. Uh, and if you if kids are doing an exercise that is a little above what they're capable of doing and you can't go and watch them and, and really have them do perfect form, you may be doing them more harm than good. So I'll keep it extremely basic. You can use the suspension trainers. Mm-hmm. You can use body weight exercises. But it would be very, very basic stuff. Standing, squat, split stance, lunge, uh, a modified push-up so that they can actually perform the push-up, a modified row so they could perform the row. Um, you could do the wall test uh, to help with shoulder mobility, but I'll keep it super, super basic. You could pick like four movements where you could pay, you know, let's say you have a class of 30 kids. You could divide them into four groups. And each group do one basic movement. So this group over here doing a split stance squat, this group over here doing these modified push-ups, this group over here doing a modified row. And you, essentially you're doing four groups and that way you can go from each group and kind of watch what they're doing. And it's not a circuit, so I wouldn't treat it like a circuit. It's not like you're trying to get them to beat themselves up. What you're trying to do is really work on perfecting and practicing technique, form, and control because that's what they're going to benefit the most from. It also gives you the least uh, risk factor in terms of injuries or you know getting these kids to do something that's inappropriate. I also like taking actually, and I totally agree with Sal. But then we just had we got tagged uh, yesterday in our our private forum with uh, a coach who was taking his soccer players uh, in a in a group in, uh, through a Turkish get up. And I think this is something. I mean, if I was in your position, this is something that I would like to do. Like I would. And the Turkish get up, you can really break the Turkish get up in like eight separate moves. So I would like make a circle of the kids around me. I would be in the center of the circle and we'd all do the first part of the That's it. Turkish get up. That's it. And I would just repeat it, repeat it until they get that part. And then I would add the second part and then the third part. And then eventually we would piece the whole Turkish yeah. get up together. And that could be a class. I mean, the whole class could literally be around breaking the Turkish get up trying to perform it and, and explain every aspect of it and then get to a place where you can actually start to teach the kids that movement. That is such a good movement that they they have to learn to articulate their entire body from their head to their toe that if you can get them to perfect that, the carryover into a lot of the other things they're doing. And it's challenging in a nice little workout just simply doing that. So um, I, I like the simplicity of just like one movement in the class and teaching that. The same thing goes for a movement like a windmill. I think a windmill has got such good carryover. It's challenging enough that you could focus just on that. And then it's also got enough parts to it to where you can kind of break it up in multiple movements and teach those movements and then put it all together. That's also an option. Yeah. I think my answer would be a bit different uh, from how I was training the football team in terms of we have a very specific objective and, you know, going through the list of exercises and trying to figure out what I can establish and get them to learn most effectively. And then what their goals are in terms of getting stronger, more powerful, you know, faster, you know, all those type of attributes versus like your average student, um, just trying to general health and, and fitness and, and strength. Um, you know, I think isometrics do help, uh, you know, in terms of them being able to slow down and, and be able to really focus on control and, and, you know, coordination and like all those types of things is just understanding their body about how to generate force. So I think there's value in it. I just don't think I would do it quite as aggressively as I did with the football team in, in terms of like, you know, really hyper focusing on that for a while. Uh, because what I was really trying to establish was like how to do that, how to generate more force in these compound lifts. Uh, because they didn't really understand that that aspect uh, in general. But I think in terms of like having the prime compass tests, I think that's super valuable. You can do that in a big group. Right. And you can go through all those and break them up. Uh, and and then you know even when you when you start evaluating like is is a, a you know a barbell squat appropriate for a lot of these kids is it even worth like kind of going that direction or just sticking with like split stance squats 
and you know focusing on like general uh fitness like in strength pursuits we're also it's like addressing a lot of the instability so you see a lot of like uh movement that you can address and and, and slow down so I, I guess well my point is i would probably focus on more like the tempo and like really like slowing it down having some kind of a maybe even having some kind of a beep uh, that they can like a cadence that they follow as they're doing the the reps. So the focus is on like a metronome or something. Yeah, the quality of the movement. Everybody's trying to hit the beat, trying to get to that next position, and then back up. And and they're doing this kind of as a group. They have somebody watching. You know, they're doing it with partners. Um, and then you know, make it fun. And so you ha you throw in a challenge every now and then. Uh, you know, to see. You know, because kids just respond best that way. Even when they're high school kids, they love a challenge. So they give them a challenge, get them engaged. Um, you know, have them do some kind of uh, sled challenge where they're where they're pushing it back and forth. Um, you know, some push up challenge. You know, you get creative with that aspect of it, but then you have the structure of it uh, really focused on like the quality of their movement and then just things that they can repeat. So. It's not too complicated. It's just lunges, it's just dips, it's just pull ups. You know, it's um, it's really basic it's things that they can carry yeah, with them. I, I I don't think any, a lot of these kids will be able to do a single dip or pull up. Uh, if yeah, you know. well, that's what I mean. You got to teach those things. Here's the key. So, Gary, I've had I've actually had the opportunity to not only train several PE teachers, but I've actually helped them write exactly what you're wanting to do. And I made mistakes earlier on, and I learned from that after I got to go see some of these classes and the types of kids that were taking. And what I learned was originally, and I feel like you're kind of asking from this, and this is why you're getting probably a shitty answer from all three of us and going like, this helped me not at all. <laughs> so I, I still have to go figure this out is you think like we're, we, I originally thought, which is I'm trying to write a workout for these kids and that throw that out. Like you're not trying to put a good workout in, you're trying to teach them something. So a whole class could literally be dedicated to just teaching tempo, like Justin said, like today, kids, we are going to learn the importance of the squat and, and tempo. And the whole class is just slowing down the process, or I'm just going to teach you an isometric lunge and, and like, or a push up, or I just mean, a push up. Right. And, and all the nuances of it, and then slowing mm -hmm. it down and talking about pot, like, instead of thinking like, I need to, I want to try and write a good workout. That's going to help all these kids. Like, Excellent point. It, that mm -hmm. th throw that out. Like, it's not like training you. It's not like training a client. It's totally different different it's like can i if you can if you can in a in a in a, uh, a semester or whatever you guys break it down a quarter or whatever what if you can teach a kid just literally the turkish get up what you have done for that kid or that group of kids is so much more powerful than if you wrote all these really good workouts that are super complex and makes them burn and sweat it's like Throw that shit yeah, out. One hundred percent. The biggest mistake that you'll you'll make, or or the, the hardest challenge, is going to be to want to get them to sweat, and to want to get them to get sore, and to want to get them to their heart rate up. Like, oh, I got to get them to sweat. It's got to be a hard workout. No, they need to perfect and practice the skills and get their bodies to move the way they want. Because all that stuff, other 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 stuff doesn't matter. So it's going to be. Yeah, can I, I get you know, them? And getting back to like Adam, what you were saying, that that was kind of the the direction I was thinking because again, well, I just finished my 28th year of teaching. And, you know, these kids, especially coming back from the pandemic, being stuck at home, you know, they're they're sedentary. And, you know, you mentioned about kids can't even do a pull-up. I mean, they took it out of the California state uh, physical fitness testing. We don't even have pull-ups anymore. We might have a modified pull-up. Um, a flex arm hang, something like that. But even a regular push up, they can't even do. Yeah, you know, yeah. very few kids, they, they give them one because they try. Mm -hmm. That's like what we have to do. Yeah. So have you I know. Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I, you just said push up and, and you brought up a good point. I, I One of the more viral videos I've ever done on our Mind Pump TV YouTube channel is uh, teaching the perfect push up. I don't know if you've watched that video, but I actually have, I teach regressions to it, how to progress it. Um, and it's a it's a hand release push up. So if you go to Mind Pump TV and go like perfect uh, Mind Pump perfect push up, it should be a video that I'm I'm teaching. Uh, that's like a class right there. I feel like you could literally take that video and then teach that yes, for, for yeah. a class. One hundred percent. The mentality yeah. of I need to give them a workout. That's the wrong mentality. It's mm -hmm. going to be I need to teach them to be able to move their bodies in proper ways. And so it's literally that, and that will actually give them better physical results. Also. They're also going to get better results from that anyway, because we tend to think that in order to get good physical results, we have to get sweat, we have to get sore. No, no, keep it as basic as possible. 
That's what you're working with, and they're going to get more benefit from it. And I think they'll probably value it more. I think that they'll enjoy mm-hmm. it more as well because they can feel and see the progress versus, oh, here's the class. We're just going to get sore and tired. And, you know, back to the isometrics thing that Justin was saying, here's why I, I don't like isometrics necessarily for a class like this. Isometrics is so dependent on intrinsic uh, tension. The second you turn your head, that kid's not doing the isometric anymore. The second you turn, they're just holding, they're just holding the position. So mm-hmm. it's very hard to monitor. Now, if I'm working with athletes, there's a little bit more of a drive and motivation yeah. and competitive act, you know, aspect. But if I'm teaching a class, I'm like, all right, guys, hold this pose and really push hard. Or what? A second I turn my head, that kid's just holding it. Yeah, I would really- look at it more. Uh, yeah, they collapse down. Yeah. yeah, I would look at it more like, so if you're teaching these proper techniques of let's just use push-up as the example, um, and you, you, you've been able to establish that. But now you want to add a little spice to it, and you can have them hold at the bottom position. Uh, as like a challenge. And right. so that's something that's like, you're not having to to cue anything else other than they're struggling in that position, in that low position. And then also too, they're getting more benefit off, you know, as, as far as like they're, they're, they're more engaged because this is like something that they're trying to, you know, beat and compete, uh, you know, people around them with. So, I mean, there's just ways to, to kind of play with it. Once you establish those, you know, the, those main type of exercises that you're really trying to uh, educate them on. Yeah. And by the way, uh looks like you got a really cool shirt on. What is that? Oh, this is uh one. Well, I, I don't want to put out anybody else's content, but this is one of the other uh, people I follow. It's I uh, I don't know if you guys are you familiar with Corey Gregory. Oh yeah. Okay. Uh-huh. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Max, max effort muscle, but yeah, that's, that's just what I had on today. So yeah, very, very, <laughs> if very I had cool. a mind pump shirt, I'd be wearing it. Yeah. yeah well, <laughs> maybe, yeah, well, we, Mid, uh, Midwest boy, right? Coal mining guy. Is that yeah, right? yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I know well, sure. well, I tell you what, Gary, normally we give away free programs, but you're in California, aren't you? Yeah, actually, you know what I was going to say too, a few weeks ago, I was up in Santana row. I was looking for you. Uh, I, I grew up uh, in, in Fremont. So uh, I was I was right up over there, but now I'm in the yeah I'm in the Central Valley. Okay, well I tell you what, what part of Central Valley are you? Um, the Fresno area. Okay, yeah, I grew up in Modesto, Oakdale, Turlock, that all that stomping ground over there. Yeah. Okay. Nice. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Well, no, I've been listening to you guys for a couple of years now, so I really uh, appreciate it. And Sal, you know, you mentioned about going to see the Mad Apple the other day, and uh, I saw that a few weeks ago, and it's kind of like what I like about your show. It's uh, you keep up on current events, and then you guys give the fitness advice. So oh, I appreciate it. it was it's a, kind of an all-in-one show. Great. It was a great show. But you know what I'm going to do, Gary? I'm going to send you some. I'm going to send you a shirt. Normally, we give away free program. I'm going to send you a shirt so you don't wear that one anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would def- definitely sure. appreciate that. We got you. No we got problem. you. We got you, Gary. Yeah, thanks for calling in, man. Appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. No, keep- thank you guys so much. Keep us posted, man. Yeah. Okay, no problem. Have a good one. All right, Gary. I tell you, man, uh, there was that one study. I I brought this up before on the show, but there's other studies that are showing this. There was a study, and I'll bring it up again. There was a study that showed that college-aged males today, so I think this was like maybe within the last six years or so, college-aged males had the grip strength of a 65-year-old in 1983. I remember. so depressing. Like the the strength and physical readiness of kids, and it's just, just, this is the way society moves because we become more technologically advanced. It's less demanding and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So I get it. But when you're working with kids today, like in the past, you'd be like, all right, guys, we're going to do pull-ups. We're going to do push-ups. They can't even do a straight arm plank, half these kids, right? So you got to bring it way back. Now, this doesn't mean that their bodies can't respond, adapt, and get stronger. They totally can. It's just you got to keep that in mind. Well, group group training is already unbelievably challenged. Yes, remember, I remember, it is. remember when I, when I rant years ago and pissed everybody off and said group training should die? Yeah. <laughs> so, There's so much truth in that. Though. I, there is. There is There is truth in that. And it's it's just really challenging to teach a, a group as it is. And then you add in the fact that they're young kids. Then you add in the fact they're deconditioned. Then you add in the fact that COVID is really fun. And they don't even want to be there most of yeah. the time. And I, so I actually, I have, I've had several PE teachers that I train. I actually had a, a really long-term client and good friend of mine who was a PE teacher and uh, I had already kind of written programs before. She was the first one that I actually got to go see it implemented. And I went, I didn't realize what a mistake I was making <laughs> until I like I saw it and I went, oh shit, like they're just not like. And so that's where I went back and went, you know what? If if 
a whole year went by and I could just get her to teach her kids how to do a proper push up, mm -hmm. it would be such a win. Yes. And, the, and, yes. and even though that's, they're not going to leave that class and be shredded and right. go, oh my God, I got all it, but I, I will help her lay the foundation for these kids that maybe that will set them off in the future that they want to train or now they have better posture because of it. And unfortunately, that PE teacher like Gary is not going to get a lot of good credit for what he did, but I promise you he's laying a solid foundation if he focuses on totally. Yeah, I mean, that's, and I'm glad you, you brought it all the way down to that point because it was like, like, I don't see barbells really valuable at all in that kind of you know they the, can't even control their body yeah they you can't my dude. and so like yeah trying to even come up with some like body weight exercises that are valuable that you can then take on with you i, you I bet if you took a hundred average middle school kids you probably would be lucky if you had two that could do a proper barbell squat yeah. with the barbell and nothing else well, on even it. student athletes now because that used to yeah. be the ones that really wanted to be there and want to improve and are performance driven right like that's that's even like degraded like substantially so yeah, so I mean, it, it's it's it is hard. It's a hard thing. You really have to sit back and like evaluate like what you're working with. Did you guys see the video I was referring to on our forum that the kid posted it? That's in our forum. No, which one? So he's a soccer coach, and he had like oh yeah, yeah I did. Yeah, 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 yeah I did. And he and he had all his, and they had this soccer ball they were balancing, yep, yep. and then he was breaking down the. No, that was great. It was great, yeah. and mm -hmm. it's just it's it's complex enough that it'll be challenging for all of them, yep. right? To get good at it. And you and it's but it's it's uh simplified enough by breaking up in eight steps. You gotta teach they, they need to know how to be in their bodies. They're yeah. just disconnected from their bodies. And you it, before you can work out, you gotta know how to be connected and how to control and move and stabilize. Otherwise a workout's a waste not only a waste of time, it's an it's a very high risk of injury and problems later on. Our next caller is Megan from Tennessee. Megan, what's happening? How can we help you? Hey guys. Well, so first of all, I want to say I have been a full-time personal trainer for six years now. So, you know, you guys are giving me content that are just helping me perfect my craft. And so I'm just so thankful. Like y'all are creating real change in my life. So thank you. Awesome. Uh, yeah. So before I, um, well, I'll go ahead and hop into the question. So, okay. I am a 28 year old mom of a two year old and I weigh 33 or 133 pounds and I'm wanting to go into some type of cut, but um, I'm at 11% body fat already. And so I kind of wanted to get y'all's intake on that, but I'll give you guys some context. Um, so I've always been really lean and I'm definitely naturally on the endurance side of the spectrum. Um, but the past nine years, I've been strength training and focusing on building muscle. And I've actually been able to put on like 20 pounds, um, but stayed at roughly the same body fat percentage. Um, so that's, I'm really, really proud of that. Uh, so my exercise routine right now consists of, so I lift heavy for four days. And then I do one day of like kettlebell work, just like technique stuff, because I love kettlebells. Um, and then I do one day of like low intensity steady state cardio. Um, I also get 10,000 steps in every day, but I take Sundays completely off of everything. Um, so my current strength is at, so I'm deadlifting twice my weight. Um, I can bench my weight. My I'm working on my mobility uh, for my squats, but I'm definitely like building that back up, my strength for that back up. Um, I've never maxed on my overhead press, but a couple weeks ago, I did 85 pounds for four reps on my overhead press, and then I can row a decent amount. So I feel like I'm pretty strong right now. Um, so my nutrition, I am, um, I eat 100% whole foods. So I eat my body weight and protein. So I get plenty of protein. I'm roughly at like 2000 to 2300 calories um, every day, and that's maintenance. So I'm not gaining or losing there. And then I also um, have never had alcohol in my life. So I just feel like really full. I feel really nourished. I don't feel run down or anything like that. I sleep roughly eight hours a day. I mean, I'm pretty religious about when I go to bed. Um, but I mean, y'all know I'm up at four or five every day. So, um, but I go to bed at nine o'clock every night. And so I feel like pretty rested as well. Um, so I feel like my stress is also pretty low, even though I have a two-year-old. Um, but my hesitation is that, like, I guess I worry if I were to go into a cut that it would just, like, I would just lose muscle and, like, potentially put on um, body fat. And so, yeah, I just wanted y'all's opinion or, um, yeah, advice on so, that. So, okay. Megan, you, you know we can see you, right? 
Yeah. Okay. You look amazing. Yeah. You laid out everything. You look amazing for someone who doesn't have a two year old. You look uh, unbelievable for somebody who has a two year old. Uh, everything you've listed off I, is like a dream to get a client to this place where you're currently at. Can I ask well, what, I what, practice what I preach? It's like, this is my job. This is what I tell my clients. And so, and I believe in what we do. So I practice it, you know, so, let me interrupt so I, for, let me interrupt for a second, Adam. So you said 11%, um, don't take this the wrong way. You don't look like you're 11%. 11% is almost essential body fat, meaning well, you, you, you look lean, but a, 11% no. is an unhealthy body fat percentage for a woman. You look healthy. I, I would guess you to be in the mid teens. Well, and so, I mean, you know, I've used, I have an in-body scale. Like that's what I'm using oh. and I'm regularly using that. So I'm not like in a dunk tank. So, or I'm not doing like the calibers, but I don't feel like I look 11% body fat. I know that I'm lean, but yeah, I'm just going off of my in-body and like before I had my baby, I was also roughly 12% body fat. So I've stayed consistently, like this was years ago, like even before I started strength training, I really have stayed about the same body fat percentage. I've just put on muscle. Yeah. Yeah, you don't look you don't look eleven. If you were eleven percent or real, you would look unhealthy. This is Katrina. I tell you that yeah. all the time. Katrina, you guys are the worst shape you've seen. Katrina is fourteen. She normally hovers around eleven to twelve. Yeah, it's the weirdest thing ever. Yeah, yeah. I know. But I it's, really talking about that, like yeah. saying that Katrina is roughly that yes. body fat. Do you do you um, so? Um, do you mind if I ask about your your hormonal cycles and stuff? Do you, are you are do you have a period or do you, are you on birth control? Yeah. So after I had my baby, my body just decided it hated me. And so all my hormones like completely bottomed out. And so, um, about a year and a half ago, I started pursuing hormone replacement therapy and then it's just been a struggle finding the right doctor here. So then like shortly after that, you guys started talking about hormone replacement therapy and I, it only like enforced, okay, Megan, you're on the right track and you really need to pursue this. So I did do a consultation with y'all's, um, the guys that y'all work with, mm -hmm. but I wanted to work with somebody in person. So finally, like three doctors later, I found the right fit. I'm on the right dose of, I'm on testosterone replacement therapy and I take progesterone. Um, so, and I've been on the right dose for about six months now. So I feel so much better. Any girl that is like questioning going on testosterone, it's a game changer. Okay. So you don't get, you're not getting like hot flashes and hot, cold temperature intolerances. And so, okay. So the hormones feel pretty balanced. Yeah. And I've, and I have a regular cycle too. So, okay. yeah. Okay. And I'm asking that because, you know, when you get too lean as a woman, one of the first easiest signs is, you know, you start to see issues with the cycle. Usually I can see in a woman's face if she's too lean or if she's in that state of like, we need to increase body fat. You don't, you look pretty healthy um, just from looking at you. I, I will, I will, I do want to ask one personal question though. Have you dealt with body image issues or eating disorders in the past? No. And even after having my baby, it was like, I, I believe in what I do. So I never put any pressure. No, it's like, I, no, not okay. at all. I mean, all right. Yeah. Well, why do you want to get leaner? If you don't, if you don't mean, mind me asking. Honestly, I just think the body is so amazing. And so like right before I had Aria, that's my daughter's name. Um, I did a half Ironman and then three years later, I'm the strongest I've ever been in my life. So I just love, I just think the body's so amazing. So I just like, am curious, but I'm also not committed to it. So like, if y'all feel like it wouldn't be appropriate, I'm like, cool. You know, no, I, I think you have the right mindset. I also think you're a healthy person in a healthy place. You're a professional in this. I see value in pushing the body to those extremes as for that reason. The fact that you're not so committed to it that if all of a sudden you started to see signs, like say you lost your period or you noticed you weren't feeling good, you could back out of it. You're not committed to it. So I don't have a problem with it. I think I think the thing we're all we're searching for is like you're in a great place right now. I mean, yeah. but I I can totally relate to wanting to push my body to an extreme that I've never seen just to see what it feels like, see what it takes, see how I feel when I get there. Um, it was an amazing experience for myself. So, I mean, I think you're in a pretty good place to do it and you have the right mindset. Yeah. Do you have plans to compete or step on stage or anything? Definitely not. I no, no. Good. Okay. So, <laughs> good. Okay, good. I and I don't want it to be like a drastic cut. Like I, I would want it to be just like, I don't know. And I want advice from you guys on that, but no, I don't have any plans yeah. to do. So that. here's, the, here's what I would focus on. If you do want to get it, cause you're, you're really lean. And if I had to guess, I'd say you're probably around 15, 16% based off of how you look, which is good. There's nothing wrong with that. It's pretty lean. 11% is typically too lean for a woman. Um, and these body fat testing methods can be off because 
if they if they guess your body fat percentage because you're a female, you may store body fat a little bit differently, and so it's going to give you a, a different type of reading. So I don't think you're eleven percent. I've never met a woman at eleven, at like a real eleven percent that looked healthy. Um, typically, it's right before they go on stage and they don't they don't look too good. But here's here's what you're going to have to focus on: not the cut. It's going to be the after, because where you're at now, you're already pretty lean. Go getting any leaner, it's going to get a little extreme with how you are with your diet. You're already pretty dialed in, so it just means you're going to have to get a little obsessive. It's going to be the afterwards. It's going to be the reverse diet that's going to be where you're really going to have to place your focus. It's going to be, can I get my body to come back? Because body fat percentage is, uh, or body fat is essential. It's extremely essential for a woman. Your hormones are closely tied to your body fat percentage. Your body will say, we're not going to be fertile anymore if it gets too lean, if we push yourself a little too hard. So you want to, it's the after that you really want to pay attention to. What you don't want to do is go down like, oh my God, I got so shredded and then just do this crazy rebound. So if you were my friend, I would say, you know, you could play with this, but be play, pay very close attention to how you feel. And if you start to feel unhealthy, just slowly back out of it. That, that would be my advice. You said all the right things for me. I, I feel like your your attitude going into it, uh, the place you're at health wise, the the reason why you want to do it. I think you're you say to me, you're saying all the right things for me to go. Let's do this. Let's have some fun. Let's go try and do this. Do, are you in our private forum, Megan? I'm not, and I have so much of y'all's content, but I was like, oh my gosh, I hope they get me in their forum. Well, okay, so I'm going to have Doug put you in our forum and just yeah, keep us posted. I would love to actually uh, watch and hear this journey because I think you're a great person to do this. And uh, just keep us posted. Have but you ever have you ever tried to gain body fat purposely? No, but I mean, <laughs> like I put on twenty pounds. Like you know, I weigh yeah, one hundred and thirty. That's twenty pounds heavier for me. So, and if anything, I'm eating more than I've ever had in my life. And I don't. I have a two year old baby. So no, like I've never. Here's another. Here's another option because you're really lean. You got. You got. Uh, you got a long. Way. You could. You could go pretty. Yeah. Another option just for fun, just to see how you feel how your body reacts, how you sleep, how you feel in your body. Another option would be, let's see if I could go on a bulk and gain uh, some body fat. Like, they're going to want me to go on a bulk before. I go. Not necessarily. Not necessarily, so, uh, not just to see what it's like. Yeah, I, I, so I agree, but I would actually do it after. You're, you're already play. I mean, I would reduce your calories a little bit because you don't need to do very much and you'll probably see that. Maybe pick up your steps. A little bit, like 200 calories. Yeah, yeah. Two, two, 300 calories. 200 three, two to 300 calories, increase your steps a little bit. Maybe uh, every once in a while, add in like some hit cardio post-workout for 12. 12 minutes. Um, I mean, and I would progressively do that. You've probably heard me talk on the show how I would do that with with competitors is we start by just increasing steps a little bit. Then I would start to add, you know, three days a week post-workout hit for 12 minutes, keep increasing steps. And then maybe that hit goes to five days. Just slowly progress that. Only cut your calories by 300, just that extra movement, the reduction in calories, how lean you already are. I bet you'll drop a few body fat percentage right there. And then when you're at the most shredded you've ever been in your life and you've kind of achieved like, okay, cool, I did this, then do what Sal's saying. Then then the goal will be, let's see how high I can get my calorie intake up and see if you could really start pushing up to 26, 2,800 calories. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I'm down for that. More food. The <laughs> All right. Yeah, but I mean, if you're the space that you're in um, and the vibe that we're getting from you, you can you can you have your base, right? You have your home base where you feel comfortable, and so now you can have fun and move a little bit up, a little bit down. Pay attention to how you feel. Get in tune with your body, and then what, what's good about this is you can identify. Okay, well, during this period of my life, I think I want to carry a little bit more body fat because it makes me feel this particular way, or you know, I think I'm going to ramp it up and get a little leaner because I feel this particular way with the context of my life. So it's good to know that, but I would never recommend that to somebody who I felt like, you know, if you came to us at your body fat percentage and we got any inkling that you were unhealthy or there was some bad food, you know, relationship issues, we would not tell you to try to get in the league. Cause I'm looking at you right now. Like I said, I don't think you're 11%, but you're lean. You're very lean. You're very fit. Um, I don't, yeah. So I, I typically wouldn't say, yeah, I think you should try and get leaner, but I think for just the experience, and you know, kind of how it's going to feel and learning more about your body. I think there may be some value there, but yeah, have fun okay. with it. Go get okay. it, Megan. Hey, and before I hop off really quick, I wanted to say like, I'm obviously so grateful for the content and I've learned so much, but I also want to say like, for example, Sal, when your wife um, went into delivery with Aurelius, like I was praying for them and hoping everything would go well. And then, you know, with Max and his surgery, I was praying for him and so happy that he's doing well. And then also Justin, you know, I know your youngest is in gymnastics and that's made me want to put my baby in gymnastics. So although like 
obviously a lot of us are here for the content, but I mean, I stayed for y'all's personality. So I just wanted to say thank you. Oh, wow. Thank you very much, man. Thank you, Megan. All right. We'll see you in the forum. Bye. Bye Bye-bye. Okay. So you know how valuable it is that we could see them? Because if she talked to us yeah. and said, I'm 11%, mm-hmm. I would have been much more... Now, Bro, hearing her talk... So here's a... Okay. But I would have been way more you know, apprehensive. Kat- you know, Katrina, I'll bring it in. She actually... I actually just recently, I was going through my old books, and she actually has them kept. I'll bring you guys a, her dunk, okay? Yeah. Under, underwater, which is like super accurate. 11, 12% yeah. consistently. But let me ask you this. She does not look 11 to 12%. No, no. I was going to say, let me ask you this. You know, out of 100 women that are that dunk at 11%, how many of them look healthy? Yeah, no, I agreed. Your point is right. But I mean, she, she looks like that. She has that kind of look to her where, and I don't know what that is, if they just don't carry hardly any visceral fat or if they're not, not yeah. hardly any on their mm-hmm. organs and stuff like that. And that's why they're so clean. The there. only truly accurate body fat test is when you, you're dead. Cadaver. Yeah, yeah, they yeah, kill yeah, your body dead. fat off and <laughs> weigh. That's true. It's 100%. Yeah, no, it, no, what it's what really, really highlights know. is, and, and I didn't want us to get too hung up on the issue 11 or of not, because it doesn't matter. Like, it's like you, you if you've consistently used a tool, even if it's in body and has room for air it's like just consistently use it's that. just seeing the trends right yeah and see but, the, but see i mean if we couldn't see her because you you can i mean look doing this as long as we have i, I can see in a, in a person's face mm-hmm. and she looked bright she looked healthy she also you know she answered questions the, she yeah, answered she questions looked, the right way so but i would never if, if i didn't see her um and and hear some of the stuff that she was saying i would not be like yeah get leaner i'd be like well, i don't I, think that's a good idea she hit it right on the for me uh the motive when you asked what was the motivation yeah uh, that that was my motivation exactly I curiosity want, yeah. yeah i, I think cool. that is awesome yeah. i think if especially it's your profession right yeah. this is not yeah. just some random person it's like this is her profession the the amount of insight i felt that i gained and the how much better of a coach and trainer i became yeah. from doing that I, it was is I don't you well, can't knowing measure. where those lines exist right and like yeah. finding your way back to homeostasis. I mean, we talk about this all the time, just trying to optimize your body in all kinds of different pathways. So it's cool that she's kind of experimenting in that. Yeah, right but now. I wouldn't be surprised if she did the leaner thing and then she got let her body fat creep up, you know, five six percent above where it's at now. And if she didn't have a better experience with the higher body fat percentage, well, a so lot of women feel they get there and they get over the like, oh, and then they're like, oh, I actually feel really yeah, I good. Feel better, yeah. A bit so higher. the only and the only thing that I, I mean, and it's if we are totally, be, I'm being totally critical at this point, right? Because I, I think she's in such a great place. Uh, I don't know if you guys remember. So Melissa was the last person that yeah. I coached for a show, and we kind of documented her whole journey. When I first got her, she was eating about 1,900 calories, was already in really good shape, very similar kind of body type as as hers as Megan's, uh, we got all the way up to 2,800 calories. Yeah, yeah that's a So lot. she could easily, with the amount of activity she's doing, the amount of muscle I see on her body, like that. Her strength is, she tells me she's got some good genetics too. Yeah. So, uh, de- double body and, weight deadlift. And, and to have that kind of strength with her body fat percentage. Yeah. Was, yeah so uh, I think a cool goal for her after she does this getting lean would be to see how high she get her caloric intake up. Yeah. I think she mm-hmm. could get her Maybe caloric. do some powerlifting. Yeah. As well. Our next caller is David from Texas. What's up, David? How can we help you? Hey guys, how's it going? Uh, I have to say before anything else, um, I'm really grateful to be able to talk to the three of you or to the four of you because I got to talk to Doug right now. (laughs) And uh, you guys have made a huge impact both in my professional life with with personal training and with my personal life because I went through a lot of stuff uh, a couple years back. And the podcast was just something that was something that I would look forward to a lot. And uh, it made things easier to deal with. I'll just say that. So I just want to say thank you, guys. Thank you, man. Thanks, man. Awesome, David. All right. So my question is, um, so I'm I'm starting a, a lean bulk. And I actually, uh, I, I ended up hiring a coach that I met on the private forum, uh, on the Mind Pump private forum. And, uh, basically, uh, I want to bring up just my delts and my, uh, buys and tries. I don't really want to bring up anything else. I'm, I'm pretty happy with, with, you know, my back development, my chest development, my legs. I'm pretty content with all that. So I just want to bring up my, my, uh, my arms really just this area right here. And, uh, my original question was, um, should I be running a program that just brings up the volume on those particular areas that I want to bring up and not, not, uh, you know, how a lot of mass builder programs will end up bringing up the volume on pretty much everything. 
And my question was, should I run something that just brings up the volume on my, on those lagging body parts? Because I feel like if I bring up the volume on everything, all my body's going to do is just grow what's easy, what's easiest for it to grow. If that makes sense, or, yeah. or worse, it won't grow at all because you're just overstimulating. You're giving mm -hmm. it too much. So yeah, that's I, a great question. Right. Um, maps aesthetic. Are you, have you? Do you own maps aesthetic Focus yet? Sessions. I don't know. I have a K before it, but I don't have Maps Aesthetic. Okay, we're gonna send Maps Aesthetic to you. That literally, oh, that's thank how, you. That's how and why it was written for exactly what someone who is trying to bring up a specific body part. Uh, you want to increase the volume, but you don't want to do it to the entire body to where you get you know you end up hitting. Yeah, it. no, really. Actually, your intuition is on point. One of the biggest mistakes people make when they're bringing up a lagging body part is they they add more volume to the lagging body part. And now they're doing too much volume overall for the whole body. So best case yeah. scenario, the whole body progresses at the same rate as before, meaning the lagging body part remains a you know, unbalanced for the rest of the body. But that's usually not what happens. What usually happens is they just end up overtraining mm -hmm. and nothing happens. So your intuition is right, spot on. So I like to tell people, do this, look at the body part that you have now that is your fastest responding, the one that you're like, look, I'm happy with it. Take volume from that body part and then add it to the body right. part that you want to bring up. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Like the the coach that that I hired. Could I give her a shout out? To, uh, by the way. Sure. Go ahead. Because I did find her on 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 the Mind Pump forum. So uh, her name is Katie, and uh, uh, the company's name is Bar Path Fitness. So she's she's really she's been really great, and you know she's super smart. She does a lot of. Uh, I can tell she listens to you guys awesome. as much as I do. <laughs> oh, good. Awesome. Good deal. Uh, but yeah, like uh. I just noticed, you know, when I first started working out, which was almost 10 years ago, um, really, like, I remember even then my traps, my back and my legs were like the first things that grew. And ever since then, I never, like, I always struggled growing my delts, especially the side delt. My arms were never uh, up to par with, with the rest of my body. Like, it always felt like they were just lagging behind. And I think a mistake that I made across the years was every time I tried to bulk, was exactly that i would just bring up the volume on everything or just wasn't really like paying attention to those body parts mm -hmm. yeah no it's uh, that's but, on point that's 100 percent on point maps aesthetic is is written that way so i would go maps aesthetic and your focus sessions are delts and arms another another small tip and i've sal said this many times on the show so you've probably heard it is uh a simple thing too because traditionally when you all of our programs are written this way and most programs you start off with like squats or deadlifts or the big movements but if i had shoulders as a specific muscle start i would go, i'm first. starting the workout with that mm -hmm. so start right so even if it's if you're following like maps aesthetic and we have squats in there i'm actually going to start my workout with my my delt my delts so even before you bench you do yeah. your shoulders you know biceps before right, back so which you never do before but in your case uh, i would do it that way yeah it's a slightly just rearranging the order just to bring priority to those body parts. That's right. Correct. Yeah. That's so right. That along with yeah. the increased volume and frequency um, and, you know, not adding it to all the body parts, that alone, over time, you should start to see some some faster results out of your weak body parts. Cool. And uh, another question just related to that is um, I struggle a lot with connecting to my adults. I think that's the reason why they don't grow is, or at least part of the reason would be that is I just... I, I, other than my rear delts, I can't feel my front and, and side delts working. Yeah. Go, go way lighter, way lighter mm -hmm. and work on your form until you feel it. This mm -hmm. means you may have to go down to like two pound dumbbells. Yeah. Even hold right. like an isometric pose and really try to squeeze and get, make that mind muscle connection sort of happen as, as the priority. Yes. This is another reason why I love the Z press. You've heard me say this probably a bunch of times on the show, like the Z, someone like you, a, a Z press and to hold and stabilize at the top, like you'll, you'll light your shoulders up. It's such a great, great exercise to teach someone to work on their connection there. So do the Z press. When you do the Z press, make sure you hold and stabilize at the top every time. It'll help work on that connection. Cool. Sounds good. I'll definitely give that a try. Thank you guys so much. All right, man. Thanks All for right. calling in, David. Yeah, thank you. You got it. Yeah, he, he literally said the biggest mistake that people make when mm -hmm. bringing up a weak body part is they they add overall volume yeah, to the workout. Volume. 
rather than what you need to do is you need to borrow volume from the body parts that respond really easily and well, and then take that volume and add it to the weaker body parts. So if it's, you know, if it's your, like for me, it was my, like my legs, my legs just respond like crazy. So if I want to bring up a body part that's challenging for me, let's say chest, I'm going to do less legs, more chest. I'm not going to just add chest because now I'm doing just total way more volume and I'm probably going to tip the scales in terms of doing too much, in which case nothing happens. One of the things that uh, we didn't say to him, but I want to make sure we comment on that when you're trying to like, like the delts, for example, or arms are like this too. If that becomes like a priority and you start to lead your workouts, uh, what you normally will see almost always is now all of a sudden your big lifts that you used to do first yeah, they drop down. They drop bit. down, That's and, fine. and people yeah. get discouraged. They think, oh, point. oh God, this isn't working, or I'm getting weaker by doing this now. Yeah. You and do they, your shoulders before bench. You're not going to be lifting. That's right. So just keep that in mind if you're somebody you're who's exhausting them. doing something like that. That is completely normal. And again, the focus is you're trying to bring the delts up. So don't worry that your bench just dropped a little bit. Uh, it's not like well, and are- also to the focus sessions, like it's it's the intensity is really something that you want to make sure and manage appropriately, and and make sure that that's you know on the lower end. Like we, I guess we kind of compare them to more of like a finisher at the end. So yeah. like we we take a lot of the exercise, mainly machines and cables and things like that, that aren't quite as damaging uh, to add in to to really keep that volume going up, but not as much on the intensity. Right. Our next caller is Joel from Hawaii. Joel, what's happening, man? How can we help you? Well, uh, first off, it's an honor to be here with you guys. Been been a fan of yours for a few years. Um, but I guess I'll give you a little bit of a background uh, for, for my question. So I've been a full-time uh, personal trainer for about three years. I started uh, working in a gym. Uh, did, thought I was doing pretty good there. Then COVID hit, shut the gym down. Um, and I still wanted to stay relevant in this craft. So I responded, two years ago, I responded to a request to work with advanced age senior citizens basically from the ages of 80 to 100 plus years old. Wow. Uh, the interview was pretty cool. It said, uh, look, we have no idea what this program is supposed to look like. All of our folks are deteriorating due to the quarantine and we need your help. Folks who can't walk, who could walk, can't walk anymore. So we need your help. Uh, so I started working and I thought I knew what they needed, but it took me a few months to figure out what they really needed. And I learned a ton. And now our goals are basically functional fitness, uh, maintaining whatever independence they have and trying to fight for that quality of life, even at that uh, advanced age. Right now, I have 28 clients with various and diverse limitations. I got folks in walkers, wheelchairs, um, Parkinson's, neuropathy of the legs. Um, some of the folks, most of the folks I can't lay down because it's, it's, it's too much of a workout to get them back up. I teach two boxing classes, two stretch balance breathe classes, two seated strength classes and I have multiple small person tribes and about 12 one-on-one sessions. All right. So long way did I know now here's the preface to the question. Besides physical therapy, there are minimal options for this age group to get their fitness uh, needs met. Um, We're talking to folks that can't get to the gym. All the personal trainers that I talk to that work with seniors, they're working with folks who can get to the gym. Um, so what resources besides physical therapy are out there for me to strengthen my skill set as the trainer for this population? And uh, the second question is, right now I use a generic senior fitness assessment. Um, are there other assessment or measurement tools out there to evaluate this advanced age uh, improvement in fitness? Oh, wow. Great question. Okay, so yeah. so just to summarize, you're, you you want to know where you can learn how to work with this population better and work with them more, correct? I've been doing research so hard and I've done everything I can to the best of my ability and I'm at a point where I, I know I can take this program further. Okay. And, and, help. And, and you said besides physical therapy. So you've already worked with physical therapists who work with this age group and you've learned, you're learning from them already? Yeah, we've got a great connection because the physical therapists, they, they kind of feel proud that they have someone to refer them to so that way they don't get, get reignited to do the same person, the same problem a year later. Um, but there's my schedule's full and I don't know where to send people anymore. Hmm. Oh, I see. Um, you know, I would look at, uh, so in terms of who to send them to, that's a real tough one. I think finding other trainers like yourself who are interested in working with the population, having someone work under you, that would be a good place to find or work with referrals. I think in terms of learning, um, I would go to the medical community and I would go with, uh, 
doctors that specialize in neurobiology. I would work with pain specialists, so uh, doctors who work with pain, pain medication, how to decipher pain, work with pain. Um, and then I would work with some mindfulness uh, individuals. And I, I like mindfulness because uh, when you're working with someone at that at that stage, some of the issue is the fact that they're they've accepted where they're at, and there's nothing wrong with accepting where you're at, but the sense that moving any further, you know, the whole saying you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Moving any further sometimes can be the challenge, and people will say to you like, "I don't care, I don't want to do that. That's not a big deal, or whatever." So, working with mindfulness uh, experts or practitioners, in my experience, brought me some value with working with uh, this particular uh, population. But and, and then you know, here's some fun stuff. You can use. So, I learned this from a physical therapist, and maybe you've already done this before. But I saw a physical therapist use a balloon as an exercise tool with uh, advanced age. And you might think, well, how, how the hell do you use a balloon? She would literally stand away from the individual and pop the balloon to them, and they'd have to reach to hit the balloon back in different directions. And it improved their proprioceptive ability. It sounds so silly, yeah. but it made a huge difference. So stuff like that, uh, you know, I found to be very, very valuable when I was working with people in that age group. Where would you guys recommend is the best resource for him as far as like isometric training? As far Ooh. either a book this or, age, or with, yeah, even, I mean, you could definitely do isometric stuff with this, this age group. You would just scale it way back, right? Yeah. We do a lot of isometrics. They seem to be very safe exercises for folks with osteoporosis and stuff. Yep. Um, one, I mean, one thing, one of my friends, Ryan Glatt, he just came out with an entire program for like neural feedback and like brain training. I think that would uh, be a, a great fit for that community. Uh, and it's really it's just about, you know, physically holding positions or just maintaining focus um, uh, while he has like a directed um, focus with, with the, the neural feedback program that he, he put together. So it's it, one of those things that isn't really addressed a lot in the fitness community is like, um, you know, that that type of uh, uh Real, real hyper focus on just just maintaining position and, and being able to cognitively, uh, kind of you know maintain control. Um, so I think between that, I, I'm trying to think of other other programs that are similar, like isometric wise. Like most of them are in the performance you know, realm. You know, Joel, I, I'm just not to get into the weeds, okay? Here, but when you look at this population, it's easy to identify that you know lack of movement um, is a big problem, right? They got to move more. They got to build some strength, build some muscle, improve mobility and bone and bone health. But there's another factor here, and you're working with their health. There's another factor here that's a big one in this age group that we tend to not pay attention to, which is there's a high percentage of these people that start to feel lonely. And some of the results that they get from working with people is just the fact that they're working with people, that they're just talking with people and moving with people. This is why I like mindfulness experts that will would love to work with this generation of, of individuals or this age group because the benefits are far reaching. Just meeting with someone, talking with someone, breathing exercises, mindfulness, the the benefits for everybody is is far reaching. But when you're looking at this, this particular age group, it's mm. massive. And you see there's studies that show improvements in physical health just from like people visiting uh, some of these senior homes, just people showing up, visiting and hanging out with them for 15 minutes. You see improvements in blood lipids and markers and mobility just from that. So that can't be overstated as well. So along we, the uh, Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I was actually going to ask Sal something uh, related to that then. So in your opinion, because you definitely, uh, out of the three of us, I'd say this is more your category, at least than mine for sure. Um, would do you think there's value in him actually getting some consultation from like a, a therapist who would actually even help him with the types of stuff to try and have conversations around or types of questions you should prod them out mm. to bring up good memories or I mean, is there do you see value in in learning some skills like that? Definitely when you're dealing with um, specific situations, uh, like if you're dealing with dementia, um, and the issues that are challenging with dementia, or, or like you just like, like you lost a partner. Like say you, you you're, yes. you're uh, with, uh, obviously at this age, a lot of these people either have just lost or maybe lost a partner. Yeah. Uh, conversation, but around. you can even take it. You can even go way back. Okay, because and okay, this is my personal experience. Okay, when when I was working with people over eighty, the word therapy or counseling, a lot of them were like no. Because that generation. No, that, I'm saying for him. Yes. He yes. goes through it. He learns some of the skills yes. that they apply to someone like yes, that. Yes. And you would So you could be like working with them and then kind of prodding them. Agreed. Like that. Yes. Okay. And then for them, things like, um, 
you know, I had a client once in this age group and I set her up. There was this, this volunteer service that would bring dogs. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> they would bring dogs and puppies to That's hang great. out with people in yeah. this age group. And the benefits were tremendous. I would see physical benefits uh, mm -hmm. from stuff like that. Just like you see That's physical detriments. Sometimes I bring my daughters with me to work out with them and they love it. Oh, yeah. oh yeah. I mean, stuff like that, right? So, so broaden your scope. You've got the physical part down. Broaden your scope and and look into like all the things that that they deal with this at this age, pain management, mobility, yeah. depression, loneliness, like you know just having someone to have a conversation with, mindfulness, like this 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 entire category will contribute to their health. I, that's such a good point, Sal. Like if you can if you can like at this age, the percentage of strength or whatever you're going to get is going to be so minimal. But if you could increase just their will to live by three percent right in everybody come, everyone that comes to my classes they're excited man oh, cool. um they're pumped up uh they're they're motivated to fight for their functions uh, i don't have to motivate them anymore oh, i used to when I first started to have to throw a balloon at them to get them moving yeah but yeah. now they're excited and um the social aspect i start every class off challenging them to remember each other's names oh that's uh, great oh yeah perfect do a, a war chant beforehand we're like hey some energy in the room and we do a war chant together so it brings that teamwork so i know some of them are just there for the social aspect yes now yeah are you using like props and aids like in terms of like so trx because i know you're focused on the function and the strength of like them maintaining their abilities like how many of those things are you incorporating with chairs and with you know things oh. that they can hold on to Minimal equipment, not a big budget, um, but I use a lot of bands. I use chairs, dumbbells. Uh, I bought a big balance be uh, rail. I use balance sticks, which are big sticks, you know, uh, for isometric exercises. Perfect. Um, and, um, and we just do a lot of postural work. I I'll be honest, I've learned a lot from you guys, especially with the Eldoa. And I'm actually signed up at the end of this uh, in two weeks to go to San Jose to that Eldoa training. And I've been using some of the things from your videos for that isometric holds and stuff. Okay. Excellent. Um, Good. Excellent. Yeah. I mean, just, just to highlight what you're saying, Joel, like you could take someone in a, who uses a walker and an exercise literally is take your hands off the walker and stand up tall. Let's hold that for yeah. five seconds. And that, or that presses hard down on the walker. Yeah. Or don't even press, just take position. your hands off and try and stand up tall and yeah. just hold that. Or both. just reach your right arm up above your head. Let's, and I would measure their distance and then I would see if we can get a little further each time. I mean, stuff like that. Right. But I, listen, I, I cannot stress this enough, Joel. I know for a fact that half of the benefits my clients got was the fact that they got to see someone and be in my studio and have conversations with everybody yeah, and have something to look forward to. Huge. And you know what's funny? The most consistent clients I had, the ones that never missed a session were in this age group. They never missed a session. And it's because they looked forward to that interaction. So that can't be overstated. So look in that direction because I think that's where you'll see some value. It, it sounds to me, Joel, like you're doing a hell of a job. Hell of a job. Yeah, I think you're I think you're 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 on the you're in the right place. You're in the right mindset. What you're growing I mean it's literally just a matter of just more time and more experience. You're you're probably better at it than any of us in here. So and this is a big like need. Great. Yeah. This is this is one of those segments of the fitness industry. I don't like have like a professional I could be like, oh this guy's killing it. Yeah. You know, so I love that you're diving into uh you know that side of fitness. Hey, you know, uh, just kind of share some of the awesome feedback. Like, so the best feedback I get sometimes is when they forget their walkers at the end of a class. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. That happened to me a couple times. I exactly. I remember. Oh, wow. You just brought back some memories. That's great. That's great. I've also been told, Hey, I don't fall down into the toilet seat. Hoping it works out. I can now lower myself down. <laughs> with Perfect. control. So, so great. It's kind of cool. so great. Things we take for granted. Joe, right? are you, in, are you in our private forum? I am not. Um, we own uh, quite a bit of your workouts uh, stuff because we enjoy the programming you guys put together, me and my wife. Yeah. Um, but I'm not in your private forum. I'm gonna we'll put you. In I'm there. gonna have Doug put you in there, and I'd love to. And I actually, since you're on the hunt and in this, uh, I'd love to hear some of the stuff that you find out on your search because, like Justin said. Um, I don't have like a go-to place that I think I would refer you to that was going to give you even more information than we just talked about. So if you find anything, I, I'd love to hear back from you in your in your process. Yeah, it feels like an untapped area unless you're a physical therapist. Sure. You're not really working, with folks. Correct. You know. Correct. All right, man. Well, thanks for calling in, Joel. I appreciate you guys. Thank you, yeah. man. Yeah, I, I, I want to say this to all the trainers listening right now because I know I know this. When cool. you become a trainer, the last 
segment of the population you think you want to work with is this age group. You I think know. you either, oh, I want to work with athletes or I want to get, you know, moms fit or, you know, businessmen, whatever. I'm going to tell you something right now. Mm -hmm. By far, this was the most rewarding segment of the population I ever worked with because you just take, there's so many things you take for granted. Like he said, he just brought back some memories. Yeah. I had, I remember I had a woman who forgot her cane. She walked out to her car, drove off, drove back, mm -hmm. comes back and goes, I can't believe I forgot my cane. And as a trainer, it's like, it's profound. Yeah. And, and it really does stretch your capabilities and you see the, the effects of what you do dramatically. So it's not like, oh, we gained 10 pounds of the bar. It's like, I was able to reach up in my cupboard and grab a glass of water. Well, I mean, you know? it just it just screams opportunity, you know, like huge like, to, to all this. Like I just the whole time racking my brain because I know like I'm sure I've met some people that have like done a good job, uh, you know, in that community. But it's just not nobody's standing out. So there's plenty of room for trainers to, you know, come in there and make a big impact. Huge. And again, they were the most consistent clients I had. They did not. And they were the hardest ones to stop training. They were the ones that were like, oh, what am I going to do? You know, without so very rewarding. So I, I I implore any trainers if you're looking for a segment, check this one out. I, re I really like that guy. I think he's uh, I think he's on the right path. I mean, it totally. sounds like he's doing a lot of a lot of the right things already, and so he's you could tell that how much joy he gets from it. So it's cool to see a trainer totally. like that. Look, if you like our information, head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out our guides. We have guides that can help you with almost any health or fitness goal. You can also find all of us on social media. So Justin is on Instagram at Mind Pump Justin. Adam is on Instagram at Mind Pump Adam. And you can find me on Twitter at Mind Pump Sal. How do I incorporate cardio and not lose muscle? I've seen people do this before where they'll start to lose the sharpness of their muscles or they'll start to lose the sculpt a little bit. And that's disheartening. But if you do it right, then you minimize that muscle loss or that metabolism slowdown. In fact, if you do it right, you can actually speed up your metabolism at the same time that you build stamina and endurance. You just have to be able to kind of program it properly. And the way to program it improperly is just to go do as much cardio as you can for as long as you can. Right.